Okay, sergeants, uh, if you begin your recordings. PC recording started. Cloud started. Backup is rolling. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations jointly with the Committee on Public Safety. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruptions, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm City Council Member Richie Torres, and it's bittersweet for me to note that this is going to be my final hearing as the Chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. More importantly, this is the first hearing for Council Member Adrian Adams as the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety. And I could not think of a better choice for the position, and I know the committee will be well served by her leadership. I think it is also fitting that today's hearing is being chaired by two members of color, which brings me to the matter at hand. Before we begin the hearing, I wanna remind everyone why we're here. At the beginning of November, a council investigation found that a high ranking member of the police department appears to have been leading a double life. By day, Deputy Inspector James Coble served as the commanding officer of the department's Equal Employment Office, the office responsible for maintaining a safe and equitable workplace culture within the department. But by night, Coble appears to have been Clouseau, a toxic internet persona who posted racist and otherwise hateful statements in an online ramp board. And I want this to be clear to everyone as we proceed today. We are not talking about insensitive comments or statements that suggest an implicit bias. We are talking about explicit and virulent hate speech. For example, throughout his hundreds of online postings, Clouseau routinely referred to black people as animals and creatures and savages. He described the first female district attorney elected in New York State as a gap-toothed wild beast. He called former President Barack Obama a quote, Muslim savage. He referred to Congressional Representative Ilhan Omar as quote, a filthy animal and to the mayor's own son, Dante, as, quote, Brillo head. And Clouseau's hatred was not solely directed at people of color. For example, he accused the Hasidic community of rampant incest and wrote that it would be good, a good thing if many of them died from COVID. This is just a very small sample of the kind of hateful rhetoric Clouseau posted. And a great deal more can be found in the council's report. These statements and beliefs have no place in a modern society, and they certainly have no place within the police department, the agency that is sworn to protect all of us, regardless of the color of our skin. This case alone should fill us all with a sense of outrage, and it should steal within us the will to make a change. But we must remember that this is not one case. These ramp boards have existed for years, and there are many, many more law enforcement officers posting the same kind of despicable invective that Clouseau did. This should present a moment of crisis to the police department in a year that has been presented so many, too many such moments. Today, I wanna to hear how the police department plans to meet this moment, but I also wanna hear from them a commitment. I want them to join me in calling for and cooperating with a full and independent investigation into law enforcement's participation in online hate speech. And when a police official is found to have posted racist or otherwise hateful material, I wanna see a full review of that officer's past work, their arrests, their testimony, their investigative work, to see whether it was infected by that official's pernicious bias. We must also recognize that this is not an issue that's unique to New York City. The police officers on these ramp boards are not only coming from the NYPD, they are coming from police departments all around the country. Just a few months ago, 
the Brennan Center released a comprehensive report finding that while recent police reforms have focused on battling implicit or unconscious bias among officers, these reforms have largely not addressed the explicit racism that remains firmly entrenched within law enforcement. That report also charges that the government's response to this issue has been, quote, strikingly insufficient. It found that although it is widely acknowledged that racist officers subsist within police departments around the country, federal, state, and local governments are doing far too little to proactively identify them, report their behavior to prosecutors who might unwittingly rely on their testimony in criminal cases or protect the diverse communities they are sworn to serve. Strikingly insufficient. That's a harsh condemnation and the phrase should sting. It should sting the NYPD. It should sting police departments all around the country. But it also should sting us, the elected officials, who have thus far failed to root out the scourges of racism and explicit hatred, hatred from within our own police departments. And so today, I'm also calling for a broader nationwide investigation into this issue. I intend to make this a priority in my new role, representing the 15th District in the House of Representatives of the United States Congress. And I intend to push the next Department of Justice to prioritize this as well. This is a challenge we must meet if we are ever going to take our place as a modern society. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Chair Adams. Thank you so much, Chair Torres. I am honored to share this platform with you and to tell you what, it's, what an honor it's been to serve with you as your colleague on the council. I'm also honored to take on this new role in leading the Public Safety Committee as chair, and I am looking forward to working with my fellow committee members over the coming months on the many important police-related issues facing our city. Today's hearing could not be more urgent or timely. The revelations about Deputy Inspector Cobell and the spotlight they have put on the phenomenon of grossly offensive posts made online by a subset of apparent current and former police officers are disgusting, disturbing, and extremely concerning. The concern, of course, is not just about one individual. It's about a system and a culture. We know there are many, many dedicated men and women who serve our police department who want nothing more than to protect their fellow New Yorkers and look out for everyone, no matter their background or identity. But at the same time, we must seize this moment to examine the rules, protocols, and attitudes of the department to ensure that anyone who expresses hateful, racist, bigoted views is simply not welcome in our police department. It's hard to imagine a more corrosive force in a police department than hate and racism. If New Yorkers cannot be, I cannot be confident that the NYPD is free of anyone who harbors such aberrant views, then essential trust between police and community breaks down. We know that the NYPD has made some efforts at teaching police officers how to mitigate implicit biases. As important as that may be, explicit bias and hate are, of course, a whole different ball game. While the NYPD's leaders have said the right things about such behavior being un unacceptable, those words need to be backed up with actions, both reactive and proactive. The enormous trust, responsibility, and power over individual lives that New Yorkers place in the police department demand nothing less. Therefore, I look forward to learning more today about the NYPD's plans to improve the ways that it ensures its entire force is free of hate and bias. New Yorkers deserve nothing less as a basic step toward ensuring that their police department will protect them and enforce our laws fairly and with the courtesy, professionalism, and respect that form the essential ideals of the NYPD. Thank you very much, Chair Torres. I look forward to today's hearing. And I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Adams, Ayala, Brannon, Cabrera, Deutsch, Powers, Rodriguez, Malone, Miller, and Eugene.
And so we'll proceed to the first panel. I think we're joined by the deputy, the first deputy inspector of the NYPD. Is he here? All right, Council Member Torres, uh, thank you so much. Let me just go through some procedural items first. Um, I'm Janita John, counsel to the Oversight and Investigations Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the Q&A portion of the administration testimony. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The panelists to give testimony will be the first deputy commissioner of the New York City Police Department, Benjamin Tucker, Deputy Commissioner for Equity and Inclusion of the New York City Police Department, Tanya Mazenholder, and Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters of the New York City Police Department, Oleg Chernyovsky. I will call on you shortly for the oath, then again when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. The committee chairs have also asked me to note for the public that we have a significant number of witnesses scheduled to testify today. We expect this to be long, but we will be reviewing written testimony, which is also part of the record, in case you need to leave before you are called upon to testify. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. To all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will read the oath, then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. First Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Police Department, Benjamin Tucker. I will. Deputy Commissioner for Equity and Inclusion of the New York City Police Department, Tanya Mazenholder. I will. Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters of the New York City Police Department, Oleg Ternyovsky. I will. Thank you all. Now I invite the representatives of the New York City Police Department to begin their testimony. Before I, uh, this is uh, Commissioner Tucker, before I uh, begin my testimony, uh, as I uh, say good morning to uh, uh, Chair Torres and Chair Adams, uh, let me just say to Chair Torres, congratulations on your your, your uh, election and um, uh, wishing you all the best in your in your new role. Um, but also thank you for your service uh, on the council uh, over these many years uh, and being having the opportunity to work with you on so many of the issues we all care about. And I wish you the best and look forward to working with you in your new role. Uh, but Chair Adams. Uh, the same thing, uh, congratulations on your new role as the new chair of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, we'll be spending some time together, no doubt. Um, I um, wish you the very best um, as, we, as we go forward uh, on issues such as those we'll talk about today, but on many others as well. So again, good morning uh, to uh, Chair Torres, Chair Adams, and the members, members of the council. I'm Ben Tucker, first deputy commissioner of the New York City Police Department. I'm joined today by deputy commissioner for equity and inclusion, Tanya Meisenholder, and assistant deputy commissioner for legal matters, Oleg Chernovsky. On behalf of Commissioner Dermot Shea, we wish to thank the council for the opportunity to discuss these important topics. With you. I wanna begin my statement by, by stating in the strongest terms possible that the words of the bigot whose posts appear, appeared online are uh, unequivocally uh, unacceptable. When a person chooses to become a police officer, they swear an oath to protect and serve the public just as I did 
when I became a young police recruit in the early 1970s. In doing so, they are granted power and authority over others. They are authorized to use force and exercise physical coercion over others according to the law and accepted standards. But they are also bound by, eth by ethical rules and responsibilities. And as such, they must strive to fulfill the oath each and every time they put on their uniforms. Their North Star must be ethical behavior. It is crucial in the exercise of discretion, use of force, and due process. The oath is rendered meaningless when one's heart contains such vile hatred and contempt for not only those we serve, but also those we serve alongside. The posts are not only an affront to the citizens of, the, of New York, and the members of this council, but also the 55,000 members of the NYPD. It is incumbent upon, uh, upon all of us uh, in leadership roles within the department to foster a culture of acceptance and respect that values the citizens of this great city and signals to our employees that we understand and appreciate their contributions as well. Deputy Commissioner Meisenholder We'll speak in a moment about many of the things we have instituted to create and, and improve uh, our environment. We recognize that in this day and age, it is simply impossible to ensure fair and impartial policing throughout our city without a disciplined, accepting, and diverse team of officers and civilians. We must never cease striving to gain and maintain the trust and partnership of the people we serve. Without real concrete action in the direction of acceptance and inclusion, this partnership, which is the bedrock principle of neighborhood policing, would merely be a slogan and would have been dead on arrival so many years ago. As a young black kid growing up in Bedford Stuyvesant in the 60s, I never aspired to become a police officer. I was not a fan of the police. Cops hassled me and my friends too often and for no good reason. But when a friend rang my bell one day and encouraged me to go with him to Boys High School to take the police exam, I went. And my life changed forever. Little more than two and a half years or two years later on November 21st, 1969, I was sworn in as a police trainee. At that moment, I believed I could make a difference from within the NYPD rather than sitting on the outside hoping things would change. Throughout my decades of service to the city and its people, the bedrock commitment I made that day is still very much intact. And along the way, I've witnessed the NYPD grow in a meaningful and significant ways. And even when we've gotten things terribly wrong, we've learned from our mistakes holding personnel accountable and redoubling our efforts to close the gap between police and community in recognition of the fact that public safety is a shared responsibility. During the past nearly seven years, we've made unprecedented progress in, in the areas of diversity within our ranks and sensitivity to the many unique and diverse individuals and groups who contribute to the fabric of New York City. At the same time, our emphasis on training, technology, tactics, counterterrorism, and building trust through our neighborhood policing philosophy has improved the quality of policing in this city. Our work is, is not yet complete, but our efforts have already paid significant dividends. And just for example, in 2019, we arrested close to 200,000 fewer people than we did in 2011. We issued over 317, 372,000 fewer combined criminal court and oath summonses, and members of the NYPD stopped fewer people than the high water mark of almost 700,000 uh, individuals in 2011. In 2019 alone, there were 1.2 million fewer combined arrests, criminal summonses, and pedestrian stops than in 2011. Firearm discharges have declined 96% from a high of 994 in 1972, 
the year that I was sworn in as a police officer, uh, to 52 in 2019. And 25 of those incidents uh, were adversarial incidents between police officers and civilians. This level of restraint is commendable in light of the fact that in 2019, officers responded to 6.4 million calls for service, over 170,000 calls for persons experiencing, from persons experiencing mental health crisis, and made 3,299 gun, gun arrests for, for possession. Furthermore, the significant reduction in our enforcement footprint is an intentional strategy that abandoned historical misperceptions that tied mass enforcement and incarceration to a reduction in crime. I think we can all agree that our rejection of that outdated belief not only spared hundreds of thousands of mostly black and brown young men from having a criminal record, but simultaneously drove crime to historic lows during this period. Today's officers are better trained and more professional than at any time in the department's history. I'm proud of the work they do every day. However, it is imperative that there be accountability when an officer behaves in a way that's counter to the mission. To that end, former police commissioner James O'Neill commissioned a blue ribbon panel to evaluate our entire disciplinary system. They found that the system was generally fair and robust but that it severely lacked transparency. The Blue Ribbon Panel made 13 recommendations, all of which we adopted, and as of today, have been substantially implemented. This includes hiring a civilian liaison whose duties will be to keep victims and families informed on use of force cases, and establishing an outside auditor to assess our ongoing compliance with the recommendations implementation. One of the key recommendations, which was codified by this council, was the development of the disciplinary panel, uh, dis disciplinary penalty guidelines or matrix. The matrix was more than a year in development and included input from, from the Civilian Complaint Review Board and the Commission to Combat Police Corruption. The matrix described the disciplinary process, the presumptive penalties for acts of misconduct, as well as the aggravating and mitigating factors that may be relevant in determining the appropriate penalty for a specific act of misconduct. At the end of August, the department published the draft matrix on the NYPD website and invited public comment. The comment period ran through the end of September and the department received 439 online comments related to the matrix. The department also received several letters from interested parties and stakeholder organizations and met with a number of organizations, including the CCRB, uh, CCPC, the New York City, the New York Civil Liberties Union, and the and Communities United uh, for Police Reform, among others, to solicit their input. The department is currently evaluating the feedback and revising the matrix. And finally, the adopted version uh, will be published on the NYPD website in January. Again, our work is not done and I will continue to come to work each day to ensure that we get better. Since Commissioner Shea took office last December, we have taken decisive action in holding officers accountable. Contrary to media reports in just under a year of his tenure, 87 members of the service have resigned while facing discipline and 50 members of the service have been dismissed. This I think exemplifies our commitment to holding members of the service accountable for their misconduct. And with respect to the allegations that a member of the service posted vile comments on the web, there is no doubt that the posts in question are replete with hateful expression. Consequently, if we determine that the member of the service is the author, that a member of our service is the author, I assure you we will hold that person accountable swiftly and to the fullest extent of the law. I thank you for the opportunity to express my views with you. Uh, and I look forward to answering any questions uh, that you may have uh, during, the, during this session.
I now turn it over to uh, Commissioner Meisenholder uh, for her remarks. Good morning, Chair Torres, Chair Adams, and members of the Council. I'm Dr. Tanya Meisenholder, Deputy Commissioner for Equity and Inclusion for the New York City Police Department. On behalf of Police Commissioner Dermot Shea, I am pleased to offer testimony about the NYPD's Office of Equity and Inclusion, OEI, and the important work we are doing to have an inclusive work environment that is fair, safe, and accommodating for all of the diverse members of the NYPD. I want to begin by making my opinions regarding the racist, anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, and misogynistic comments, which were made under the pseudonym Clouseau, very clear. I am appalled. I am outraged by these reprehensible and deeply disturbing posts. I couldn't agree more with Speaker Johnson and Chair Torres that these postings were deplorable and intolerable, reprehensible and unprofessional and that bigotry has no place in the NYPD. It is unacceptable to have employees in the NYPD who have these views and behave in this manner. These actions have caused tremendous harm, both internally among our employees and in the work we are doing to repair trust and improve relationships with the communities we serve. Regardless of the outcome of the investigation, our work is coming under scrutiny. It is my hope that my testimony here today will reflect the professionalism of my team as a whole and allay any fears that the allegations mentioned are reflective of the actual work being done to ensure allegations of workplace misconduct are investigated thoroughly and impartially. The Office of Equity and Inclusion was established in 2018 under the leadership of then Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill and First Deputy Commissioner Benjamin B. Tucker. In addition to the many improvements in the NYPD over the past few years, they recognize the importance of dedicating an office to further diversity, equity, and inclusion ideals throughout the department. Our mission in OEI is to ensure that our employees are treated with dignity and respect in the workplace, to identify and address obstacles to success, and to promote a workplace that is safe and free from harassment discrimination and harassment. We also understand that employee satisfaction has a direct nexus to how we treat each other in the workplace and how we serve the citizens of New York. The NYPD is one of the most diverse police departments in the nation, and we are continuously striving to become more diverse and inclusive with each new recruit class. A few weeks ago, we welcomed a new class of police officers that is 24% female, 34% Hispanic, 13% Black, and 13% Asian. Nearly 20% of the recruits were born outside the United States, and one third of them speak 31 different languages. Over 60% are New York City residents, and 12% were police cadets. In order to continue to make advances in the diversity of our workforce, we have taken additional measures. In OEI, we examine employee demographic trends over time and among multiple dimensions with a focus on developing policy and procedural recommendations. We consider best practices and data collection and also ensure we are in compliance with legislative changes, for example, gender identity. In addition, we also recognize and explore the often overlooked but significant differences among the makeup of our civilian and uniform one of our primary objectives in OEI is to identify and understand obstacles to achieving a diverse workforce. We focus on various phases in the employment life cycle for both prospective and current employees, including recruitment and hiring, entry level training, civil service and discretionary promotions, and retention. Employee engagement is an essential component of our work, and we actively strive to ensure our employees' thoughts concerns and experiences are heard and valued. We also work closely with our employee resource groups to understand various issues affecting their members. We have spearheaded a host of initiatives, including, but not limited to, employee forums on race and law enforcement, our LGBTQIA plus working group, various efforts 
focused on female employees, as well as leadership focused initiatives, including command and girls. Although not exhaustive, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight a few of the initiatives which OEI has been invested in. Since June of 2020, OEI has hosted discussion forums for employees to share their experiences and views on race and law enforcement and issues related to social justice. These discussions have covered various topics, including racial identity, systemic racism, diversity, acceptance, leadership, and barriers to equity in both the department and society in general. And while the focus is on race, many other issues are discussed. Issues related to gender, classism, sexual orientation, how we treat each other in the workplace, and how we work with the community. Many of the themes throughout the course of these discussions have included ideas on how to create a more inclusive and equitable department. Our LGBTQIA plus work includes partnering with the Gay Officers Action League goal, as well as our NYPD, LGBTQIA plus liaison, and other internal and external stakeholders to address issues specific to our LGBTQIA plus employees in the broader community. We focus on awareness and support, training, policy, and compliance. We are collaborating on a gender identity and expression booklet and a bias-free language guide, which includes information on gender programs. And in 2019, we partner, partnered on an anonymous and confidential employee survey designed to explore LGBTQIA plus within the NYPD. Though we understand that an individual's LGBTQIA plus identity can be either a public or a private matter, we are driven to explore these experiences because insensitivity, intolerance, and or negative behavior towards the LGBTQIA plus community has far reaching effects on many of our employees and is unacceptable in the workplace. We support and host various efforts that focus on uniting and empowering women in the NYPD, working in partnership with the Police Women's Endowment Association. We host an annual women's conference that is not only a networking and mentorship opportunity, but also an opportunity to hear from guests on a range of topics impacting women in police. In 2018, OEI initiated the NYPD Women's Institute where we bring together hundreds of uniformed and civilian women on a regular basis to discuss areas such as financial management, mental health and well-being, and work-life balance. We're also actively engaged in an effort to support employees on issues related to pregnancy and child care leave. We've created a toolkit with information related to fertility, pregnancy, legal rights, policies, and procedures to help employees navigate the process. In addition, as part of our reasonable accommodation process, we ensure employees returning to the workplace have access to lactation rooms throughout the department. We are also aware of how much leadership affects the culture of the department. OEI conducts conferrals with commanding officers to ensure the mission of promoting a fair and inclusive workplace that is free from discrimination and harassment is explained to our executive members. Conferrals reinforce commanding officers' obligation to promote a fair and inclusive work environment environment and ensure that every opportunity is taken to reinforce these concepts with the supervisors and employees under their command. Pertinent patrol guide and administrative, administrative guide procedures including workplace discrimination, display of offensive materials, and personal social media accounts and policy are reviewed to reinforce the potential harm such issues may cause to their personnel. Our training and awareness unit educates employees on matters related to cultural awareness and coordinates with the training bureau to ensure that training related to diversity, equity, inclusion, equal employment opportunity, and reasonable accommodations are delivered to all personnel appropriately. We utilize a variety of methods to conduct training of our people, including in-person recruit and promotional training and online trainings via NYPD Youth. We publish pamphlets and guidelines to educate our staff on appropriate and inclusive workplace behaviors. My responsibilities also include oversight of the Equal Employment Opportunity Division, EEOD. This unit ensures the department's compliance with federal, state, and local laws, identifies equal employment opportunity problem areas, 
and insist in their resolution. Through our reasonable accommodation unit, we respond to and address all employee and applicant requests for reasonable accommodations. OEI is also the department's primary liaison to New York City's disability community. We manage the implementation of accessible NYPD, which is the department's plan to make all precincts more ADA accessible. We partner with disability rights organizations and the mayor's office for people with disabilities on ways to better serve the disability community. In 2019, the EERD received 252 complaints. Employees can also file complaints with the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the New York State Division of Human Rights, or the New York City Com Commission on Human Rights. Our EEO investigators are Cornell certified and receive specialized training from DCAS, as well as specific internal investigation training. We have multiple levels of review across the entire process that reduces the amount of discretionary decision-making that any one individual has. These layers of review include independent reviews by two attorneys and two uniform supervisors. Additionally, each command in the NYPD has an EEO liaison. The Equal Employment Opportunity Liaison Network has been in existence since 1986 and includes a diverse group of representatives from each command. EEO liaisons are trained to provide assistance to complainants, witnesses, and others regarding any equal employment opportunity matter. As with every supervisor and civilian manager in the department, EEO liaisons are mandated reporters. The goal of the program is to provide an additional layer of protection for our employees and to, and to assist the Office of Equity and Inclusion in its ongoing mission to promote a bias-free workplace and eliminate employee discrimination within the department by increasing the range of incidents which EEOD may become aware of. Although I am confident in our process, I recognize that trust has been impacted. To that end, I recommended we enlist an outside entity to conduct an independent review of our EEO processes and cases. This will add an additional layer of examination to ensure that objectivity and diligence have been carried out and any anomalies can be addressed. In closing, while our work in OEI is primarily fo focused on our employees, it extends to our communities and plays a vital role in fulfilling our mandate to serve and protect the residents and business owners of this city. We understand that how our employees are treated and feel in the work workplace is not only critical to their well being, but also has an impact on the communities we serve. As we continue to listen to the concerns of our employees in the areas of equity and inclusion, we also listen to the concerns of the communities we serve. All of New York City's diverse communities are critical stakeholders in how we continue to improve to meet the public's needs. As you know, the city, the NYPD, Urban League, the FPWA, and Robin Hood are presently in the midst of a reform and reinvention collaborative process. In partnership with highly regarded community leaders, we are creating enduring processes building new relationships and sharing a dialogue to ensure that community members of all backgrounds play an integral role in determining the future of policing in this city, lasting well beyond the state's April 1st mandate. Many of the themes throughout the course of these discussions have included ideas on how to create a more inclusive and equitable department. I am proud of all we've accomplished thus far in OEI. However, there is much more work to be done. We will continue to do everything we can to make the NYPD a fairer and more inclusive workplace. I want to thank the council for holding this important hearing and for the opportunity to discuss these issues. We look forward to any, answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from the chairs. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. A reminder to chairs Torres and Adams, you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourselves during this period. Thank you. Chair Torres, please begin. Quickly, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by council members Menchaca, Cohen, Rose, Salamanca, and Gibson. Um, commissioners, I want to thank you for your testimony and I, and I appreciate the clear 
uh, denunciations in your testimony. I want to start with a, a simple question. You know, a person who engages in hate speech and explicit bias online, a person who refers to people of color as wild animals and wild savages and wild beasts, does such a person have a place in the police department? Absolutely not, council member. Uh, I, it certainly, I have to say that um, I was no less shocked than, than, um, than anyone else on this call with respect to learning that the possibility of not only a member of the service, but a, a senior member of the service engaging in this kind of conduct is, is absolutely, as I said in my remarks, it's unequivocally unacceptable, period. If it is unequivocally unacceptable, then when is the NYPD going to fire James Cole? Well, there's a few steps we have to take in, 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 in the, along the way. And uh, as we would with any other investigation, uh, we are, uh, when we learned of this uh, and it first came to our attention, we, we immediately um, asked in our Internal Affairs Bureau to begin an investigation. That investigation is still underway. Uh, we are uh, awaiting some additional information based on subpoenas that we've issued, uh, but I can assure you that when we get enough information to feel satisfied uh, that this individual uh, that we've alleged is alleged to have engaged in this, in this outrageous conduct, uh, if once we know that, then we will move with all the liberty uh, to, to address it. Uh, I will tell you that that under our our disciplinary matrix, uh, the penalty for uh, uh, for this type of conduct uh, ultimately it, it will be in term uh, termination from from the department. So uh, that is uh, remains to be seen based on uh, my you know what we know uh, and what we learn uh, down the road. Uh, but we hope to conclude that information as quickly as we can. And right now, it just relies on our getting that additional information uh, from the parties from whom we, we requested it. Can, can you provide us with a, an update on the status of the investigation? Well, that's it. I mean, I, I can about, pretty much about as much as I can say uh, about it. Um, we, are, we, we are moving with all the liberty to, to gather. We've gathered a number of conducted interviews. Um, and uh, interview the individual in, in, in question. Um, we have, um, in, the, in the abundance of caution, because of the sensitivity of the position that he held uh, in EEO, we moved him, we modified him uh, uh, immediately uh, and moved him to a, a location in the department where he had no contact with, with, uh, with anyone in, in, in the public. And he's not responsible for any types of, uh, he has no responsibilities for any type of investigatory or other uh, responsible uh, decision making in this regard until we uh, move along further in the investigation and, and conclude it. See, Commissioner, the concern I have and the concern that my colleagues have is that we might wait indefinitely for accountability that might never come. You know, the council released what I thought was an exhaustive report establishing that James Coble was in fact Clouseau, and that's a report that has not been disputed by the NYPD and frankly cannot be disputed by the NYPD. The biographical commonalities between Coble and Clouseau are too coincidental to be a coincidence. And according to the New York Times, the NYPD found a digital photo of Clouseau on the phone of James Coble. So Given those facts, at what point are you going to be prepared to hold Coble accountable? Uh, I'm concerned about waiting indefinitely. How, how long do we have to wait for this officer to be held accountable? Well, I, I, we're not even close to indefinitely. Um, and uh, I think you would agree that um, we're, not, we're not taking that particular path. We are uh, equally concerned about this, but there are processes we have to follow. Uh, we'd like to be certain when we make this decision. And we're close to making that decision. So it won't be uh, inevitable uh, that we are continuing down the road with no action by us. And more importantly, that there have been nothing but um, um, aggressive um, in terms of the investigation that we are conducting. 
So we will we'll conclude it as soon as we have the additional information from these subpoenas that we put out uh, and, and we'll, we'll act on it um, immediately thereafter. I, I feel like I have to pressure you a little more because we're certain that Cobol is Clouseau. What does certainty look like to the NYPD? What's the magic bullet that you're searching for? And how can we be assured that you're gonna find it? Oh, we'll find it. I mean, we're close enough now. Um, we'll find it and, and, and we'll pursue uh, the action that we know we need to take once we do. So close enough, what, within weeks, within months? Can, can you give us some clarity about a time? I, say, I, I can't give you a definitive time limit. Uh, it certainly will not be months. Uh, I can't tell you that it's going to be on January 1st. Uh, it could be tomorrow. Uh, I just haven't gotten an update uh, recently with respect to uh, the, the latest update that I've received is that they were still waiting on this information to, to come in. Um, I expect, and they expect, the investigators expect that they'll have that information uh, shortly. You know, what I find troubling is Clouseau is the tip of the iceberg. You know, James Coble posted on an online message board known as Law Enforcement Rant under the pseudonym Clouseau. And according to the New York Times, message boards like these have been in existence for more than two decades. You know, how long has the NYPD known of the existence of these online message boards? Well, we've known about the rant for, for probably since it, it existed. Uh, when I learned about it, I didn't know about it, but when I did learn about it, I learned that it's been around at least a decade uh, on and off and that the people who are on it are police officers, not just you know from law enforcement, but, but individuals who are not part of law enforcement as well. So yeah, uh, we know that, that the grant exists uh, and we know that oftentimes office members of the service are on that, on that uh, posting on that, on that uh, uh, site. I don't know if I heard you correctly. You said you've known for about a decade? I have, that's when I learned about it. Uh, just so as this came up and I asked, well, how long is this? this I didn't know the platform existed because I'd been gone from the department for a while. So uh, I wasn't aware of this particular site. Um, but we do have, you know, social media, we review um, and we have rules in, in place. And, and the minute we learn about conduct like, like this or even, and which is rare thus far, um, no less disturbing, however, uh, when we do learn about it, we will pursue, and we do pursue discipline if we have officers who are using social media in ways that, that run uh, afoul of their ability to, to perform their, their duty effectively um, uh, because they've engaged in uh, conduct that runs counter to uh, their role and what the uh, oath is that they took to serve the city and the public. And you're aware that members of your department are engaging in hate speech and explicit bias on these online message boards. Well, I don't know that for a fact. I mean, we haven't, we don't, we don't monitor that site regularly. Um, you, you think um, Clouseau is the only one? Uh, I don't know. Hundreds or thousands of people. Well, the, 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 I don't know that he's the only one. Um, you might suggest that it's reasonable to assume that there are others, and I could agree. But so, have you, so given the probability that more than one officer is likely spewing hate on these online message boards, have you ever attempted, has the department ever attempted to monitor and investigate these message boards and unmask the identities of officers on these message boards? Well, we, I can tell you that up until now, we haven't, we haven't invested an uh, inordinate amount of time looking at this site to try and troll that site to find out whether or not there's a member of the service engaged in um, post, uh, posting to that site. Um, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily know. And, and the real question is um, how, if when we learn of it, did we lose the deputy commissioner? As a practical matter in that, in that type of an activity uh, to try and figure out who's on that site and then make the connections uh, that, uh, that the council made, um, what I understand quite by accident, backing into to that um, 
to, 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 to discover uh, the, the current uh, individual who's known as Rousseau, uh, it's really time, it, it, it takes an inordinate amount of time. And so I'm not sure, and we, we, we're, we're considering how we might screen and, and pay attention to what's on that site for sure. Um, certainly to the extent that we, in many instances, will get people who will, uh, members of the service or others who will give us information uh, about conduct of officers in one way or another, not just in this context. Uh, and so when that happens, we can begin an investigation, but to uh, unilaterally you know, get on the site and invest resources that could be used elsewhere for other purposes um, as it relates to how we serve the city, particularly in this environment, uh, is a consideration for what we might do going forward. I, I just I find that to be a strange statement to to suggest it's not it might not be a priority for the resources of the NYPD. It seems to me explicit bias corrupts policing, and the NYPD has a vested interest in knowing which officers have explicit bias, which officers have animus against religious and racial and sexual and ethnic minorities. Um, given that best interest you have in knowing which officers have explicit bias. Would you acknowledge that it was a mistake not to monitor this site and not to attempt to amass the identities of these officers? No, I wouldn't acknowledge that it's a mistake. As I said, it hadn't been a priority and, and it, it, it certainly is on our radar now. What we will do about it and how we go about down the road, uh, thinking about how to, to, to monitor that site and what resources we're gonna dedicate to doing that um, is still an open question. Uh, well, I find it troubling that the NYPD has known of these message boards and the hate speech on these message boards for years, in fact, for a decade, and the department did nothing and has only begun investigating them in the wake of the city council's re report. Um, so I take it you've done no investigations into this is the first investigation you've done into this explicit bias on online message board. Does Clouseau represent the first of its kind, the first investigation of its kind? To my knowledge, I don't know that that's, that's the case. If, if a member of the department communicates explicit bias on an online message board, um, who in the NYPD is responsible for investigating? It, it would be either, it could be, depends on how it comes in, how it comes to our attention. So it could be, it could be CCRB, depending on the nature of the language. It could be our Internal Affairs uh, Bureau. So that's typically what you would get. I mean, that's what happens now in, in many instances. Uh, and um, if it comes directly to Internal Affairs, it, it may then be referred depending on the nature of the, the the conduct and the language, uh, you know, certainly CCRB has as part of its four categories of investigation um, for allegations, uh, certainly um, this fits into offensive language at a minimum. And so that, that complaint could be referred uh, to, uh, to them uh, and they would follow up with an investigation and would come back and they'd make their recommendation to come back to us. And suppose- one, uh, just one way. So, so suppose a member of the NYPD were to express an explicit bias against a fellow NYPD official, would that fall within the purview of the Equal Employment Opportunity Office or Equal Employment Office? Oh, it certainly uh, be, be one of the, the, the options. But I said, it, it could go to EEO as well, it could go to CCRB, it could go to IAB, wherever it goes, it's going to, it's going to be investigated. Um, and it depends on uh, who investigates, it depends on the nature of, of the, of the, but, the action. But it, it, it's fair to say that uh, Deputy Inspector James Coble, who was the Equal Employment Officer for the NYPD, would have been, could have been responsible for investigating the kind of misconduct for which he is presently under investigation. Well, yeah, if we didn't know, and we didn't, if if we don't know that he is someone who's engaging in that conduct, and he just happens to be in that 
current position now and, and as a CEO and, and, I, and he was a, the executive officer there for a number of years, but if there was no, nothing in his background to suggest that he harbored this type of, if he turns out to be this individual, I think you might agree that, that it would be, you'd be hard pressed to, based on his record and based on what we knew about him and his, his contacts with other members of the service over and throughout his career, um, no one would ever have imagined that he was this villain. And so, you know, the question is a good question, but but the answer to it is not that easy, only because, you know, you, you don't, the facts don't fit that way. It's not that clean. You don't end up with a situation where, unless you know or have some reason to believe that an individual is engaged in that conduct, that you're going to then take some steps to, to address it. Uh, very often, as I said, that information could come to us um, in some ways. That is not the case here, other than um, uh, with Cobal, uh, we didn't we didn't have any inclination and no reason to to suspect or believe that uh, that he would be the person uh, who was posting uh, that that uh, that uh, hateful expression uh, language on on the site. And council member, if I could just add, and I think Commissioner Meisenholder uh, can go into it a little deeper, that there are multiple avenues or multiple locations where uh, employee on employee, for example, um, an allegation could be made. It could be made direct to the state. It could be made direct to the NYPD. It could be made to the city. But when you talk about our own EEO office, uh, in your example, the way the, the process is structured internally is that no one person has the ability to dictate how a case goes. And I think Commissioner Meisenholder may be able to shed a little light on that. So even though any one person uh, may have cer these certain views that we are not aware of, that one person, based on the way the system is designed, would not have a disproportionate impact on an investigation. But, but, but I, think it's, 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 I think it's clear from the commissioner's comment that James Coble could have potentially played a role in investigating the conduct for which he himself is under investigation. But I wanna, I guess the question that I have and the question that everyone, is how could this happen? Like the comments of James Coble are shocking to the conscience and people are wondering how could someone consumed with such vitriol like bigotry be appointed as one of the point people on anti-discrimination within the NYPD. I'm curious to know who in the NYPD appointed James Coble as the EEO commanding officer. So when I joined the Office of Equity and Inclusion a little over a year ago, Inspector Coble was in already in position there. He had served under two prior deputy commissioners and had been there for approximately five years as the executive officer. There was no indication until now, and I should say to you, Chair, thank you for, for bringing this to our attention, that he could have been involved in this type of- With respect, Commissioner, that my question was who appointed him? Was, was that you or- No, it was, it would have been under Commissioner Neldra Ziegler. And did Commissioner Shea have a role in appointing James Coble at all? To the EEO division? No, he was not the police commissioner at the time. And before promoting Coble to the commanding officer of EEO, did the NYPD conduct a background check to determine if, if he had said or done anything disqualifying in his past? Yes, we review all executive promotions. And the NYPD... Go ahead. Well, and clearly the NYPD knew of the message boards yes. when James Coble was under consideration for EEO commanding officer. Uh, did you ask James Coble whether he had ever engaged in hate speech on online message boards? You were aware of those message boards and this could be a question that you would ask in a background investigation. Was that question asked? No. Should that question be asked? In future background investigations, under oath, I think it is. It is a question that should be added 
to anyone that joins any sensitive position in the police department and especially the uh, it just seems to me, you know, if you're an agency committed to promoting diversity and equity and fighting discrimination, whom you appoint as your EEO officer should pass the most rigorous background investigation, should be beyond reproach, should be an exceptional officer, not a run of the mill officer. And so what uniquely qualified James Koval to be the EEO commanding officer would seem to me you would want to appoint someone who has a demonstrated commitment to fighting discrimination and promoting equity. Was there anything in Koval's background that suggested that he had a commitment to fighting discrimination that uniquely qualified him for this delegate position? So during his tenure as executive officer, and you know, he worked with other members of the team including agency attorneys that are assigned to our office to address a number of issues related to EEO throughout the department. So we made improvements to our policies in terms of religious head coverings, facial hair, lactation rooms, any number of things that impact equal employment and reasonable accommodation throughout the department. So as part of the team in EEO, which is executive staff and attorneys, then yes, he did take part in driving some of those improvements. I guess my question is, how did he end up there in the first place? Like, like someone determined, someone question. determined that James Coble is such is is uniquely qualified to be part of this office. What I want to know is, how could you possibly come to that determination? Like, what exceptional thing did he do in his career that that justified his appointment as an executive officer and then ultimately as a commanding officer of equal employment of the equal employment office. Let me let me just say that 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 I think your your assumption is 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 not the way in which members of we have like 800 senior executives in, in the department and the, it's the sum total of their careers and things that happen throughout their careers that give that's on the record about who this individual is. So who Ben Tucker is um, and why is he being he made captain? Um, we're gonna send him to this precinct or that precinct or this assignment or that assignment. Um, the presumption is um, looking at his record or her record that you get a sense of who they are. Certainly um, if we, and, and so there, there's sometimes the absence of the record. Um, and if even if you ask the questions, uh, you may not get the answer that you that you that you're looking for. So so the determination of there's not it, it, you look at the assignment if this person's been a good administrator depending on what assignments this person had when he was a precinct commanding officer when he was an executive officer in other in other in other assignments around the, throughout the department and that this is how it it works with respect to how people move around. Uh, to different assignments and how they get promoted based on the merits of, of their activity um, and, and, and the way in which they, they've conducted themselves generally um, and, and specifically. So you wouldn't necessarily know, and especially in this case, there was no reason to know uh, or believe or assume that he was any more likely to be the person that we believe him to be now um, than anyone else in the department. And so we wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily, you know, make that assignment. And, and now, you know, as, as we look back, think, well, wow, if he'd asked that question, and I don't even think you'd believe this, that if he is the person we think he is, and we'd asked, even if we'd asked him that question, and his record doesn't demonstrate that there's any reason we should ask him that question, that he's going to say, oh yeah, I'm that guy. It's just not going to happen. So, so I think that's, so your question is, is, is a good question, but, but I think it doesn't jive with the realities of, of, of the way people are assigned in the department. Um, and, um, and as a result, it, it's hard to really, you know, make that determination now with, in hindsight 
and 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 you know and say but, well, but that's the that point of it. I want to assess what went wrong, right? And I would recommend asking the question under oath and asking the question under the threat of penalty, right? It could be the case that there was no reason to think James Coble was a virulent bigot, but it's not clear to me that there was any reason to think that he was uniquely qualified to be in the EEO office. And, and I have not heard what in his background uniquely qualified him to play this role that should only be reserved for exceptional irreproachable officers. Uh, but I don't want to, I don't want to dwell on this. Are, are you familiar with um, QAnon? Familiar with? QAnon. No, I'm not. Okay. So uh, according to the New York Times, QAnon is the umbrella term for a sprawling spider web of right-wing internet conspiracy theories with anti-Semitic and anti-LGBTQ elements that falsely claim the world is run by a secret cabal of pedophiles who worship Satan and who are plotting against Donald Trump. In your view, does a person who associates with that kind of conspiracy movement, does that kind of person belong in the NYPD? I would think not. Or are you aware that one of the officials in your department, Sergeant Edward Mullins, appeared on television with a QAnon mug associated with one of those conspiracy movements? No, I'm not aware of that. And if it were true, which it is, do you think you should be fired for associating with a conspiracy movement that traffics in hate? Well, Mullins is a, he's a union person. Uh, but he's also on the payroll of the NYPD. So I'm not asking about his role at the SBA. That's beyond your control. Mm -hmm. But he's on your payroll. And he associates with a known anti-Semitic, anti-LGBTQ conspiracy movement. And you've agreed that such a person has no place in the NYPD. So my question, just like I asked about Coble, when is Ed Mullins going to be held accountable? Well, we don't know. I don't know for sure. We haven't investigated it, and I don't know that he is. So I couldn't you're, tell you. You have, you have not investigated. You're not investigating Ed Mullins. No, we haven't. We haven't begun an. As far as I know, we haven't invested. We don't have an investigation into Ed Mullins in, in in that capacity. So we've heard otherwise. You know, obviously, as you know, in April of 2020. Um, Sergeant Mullins directed an epithet at I Ford. Council, Council Member, yeah, if, if I may interrupt, I think you, sure. you, may be, you both may be speaking past each other. I think what the commissioner mentioned is an investigation relative to what you just uh, mentioned about QAnon, not about the letter that was sent by you a couple of months ago uh, making certain allegations, if I, if I can clarify that. So there's no investigation into his association with QAnon. Is that what you're telling me? I, I don't believe that was an allegation that was made in the letter, unless you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. I haven't read the, the letter that, that was sent. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a question of whether it was uh, in my letter. It's, it's in the public. No, no, I'll say this is the first. No, but it, it, if I suspect you read the papers. I suspect you watch television. It is in the public record that Edward Mullins appeared on television with a QAnon mug. And QAnon is a right-wing conspiracy movement that traffics in anti-Semitism and anti-LGBTQ bigotry. That does not justify an investigation in the NYPD. I mean, and the allegation was not made. I think there may have been an article back in that time about a mug being, being in the photo or in, in the background, but this sort of allegation of, about an association with the group would, has not been made. There were other allegations that were made and that was the basis. Why, why, why do you have to wait? I don't understand, why do you have to wait for an allegation? If, if it's seen on television or read in the papers, why can't that be the basis for an investigation? Why, did, why does there have to be a formal allegation? I mean, to, to start with, we're, we're talking about a, a mug. 
I mean, it's not a, it's not an expression of the view. It's not an outward association. We're talking about a coffee mug in the background. I mean, that in itself is as a trigger. I mean, again, I mean, we're, we're what we're saying is first. Okay, so let, let's, let's let me let me change it. What if what if it was a a SWAT sticker? What if what if it was a KKK hoodie? That doesn't justify I, the NYPD looking into it. I don't. No, I think. Like, I at think, what point do you investigate? I think those types of symbols carry a different weight based on definitions and hate speech and hate crime. That I don't believe. I don't believe the. The organization you're talking about, a you know, coffee mug bearing, uh, whether it's a symbol, I'm not really that familiar with it, so I apologize. But whether it's a symbol or letters, I don't think that carries the same weight in terms of what, what our laws are and the way our laws are structured as a swastika. I want to move on. Painting a swastika on, on a wall or on property. Is, is actually a crime in the penal law. It's, I mean, it's I, a hate crime. Well, some of us would consider QAnon to be um, unacceptable behavior, unbecoming of a of, of a police officer. But I want to I want to move on. Well, we're not, we're not that that's acceptable. I'm just I'm just saying that that wasn't the trigger for. Well, it, by by not investigating it, the NYPD is accepting it. But but I want to move on. In April of 2020, Sergeant Mullins directed an epithet for then commissioner Barbeau. And in September, uh, more than five months after Sergeant Mullen's attack on commissioner Barbeau, uh, commissioner Shea told me in a written letter that the police department's investigation into Mullen's behavior is still ongoing. And, and I just, I, I need you to explain to me why it would take five months or now eight months to investigate something that Ed Mullins himself openly admits to doing. Like he did it publicly and apologetically. What is there to investigate him? Well, first of all, I didn't realize that there was an investigation on, on underway for that particular issue. So not aware of it. So I can't speak to why it's taking so long. I don't have an answer for you today. I can get back to you. When I find out what the circumstances were and exactly what the facts were, I'm happy to do that. Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna allow my colleagues to answer questions, but I feel just the, the, the lack of investigations into some of the misconduct that I laid out and, and the leisurely pace of these investigations, right, gives the troubling impression that the NYPD is complacent uh, when it comes to fighting bigotry in its own ranks. And, and that to me will only deepen uh, the credibility crisis of the department. Uh, I wanna allow Chair Adams to ask a few questions. Thank you so much, Chair Torres. And um, hello again. Uh, first Deputy Commissioner and uh, Deputy Commissioner, and of course, uh, our Commissioner for Legal Matters. Welcome, and thank you for your testimony thus far. I have to admit, um, the responses to Chair Torres's questions um, have left me a little baffled uh, this morning, uh, or this afternoon now. Uh, I'm a little uh, uh, disappointed in the responses. Uh, um, let me just start by asking and, and kind of going back a little bit on what Chair Torres was asking when it comes to evaluating and vetting leaders of OEI and EEO. Um, uh, I, I heard that, you know, it's the record or their record. So if there's nothing in their record that would raise a flag is what I'm understanding so far. What is it, what else is it about one's record? that would propel them to a role of leadership in OEI? Is there anything specific that they might have done that is um, uh, something paramount in a community, something that has put them on, uh, you know, on, on some kind of a clear path of something terrific that they've done 
to elevate them and give them the status of a leader in OEI? What specifically in that record? Is it the number of years? And if it's just tenure, I've got an issue with that. But can you give us a little bit more of what exactly uh, has to appear or would appear in one's record to propel someone to leadership? Sure. So one thing I'd like to mention is, is the team that we have in place now in OEI. So to give you a sense of our executive staff, first, I'd like to mention that the director of EEO is a former JAG Navy attorney who spent the vast majority of his career with the Navy working on sexual harassment reforms for the military under Senator Gillibrand's leadership. So that to me was very important in terms of bringing on board someone that was legally qualified and that had a long history with EEO in the department. Our assistant commissioner, Monica Brooker, is a clinical psychologist with a background in organizational psychology and has decades of research on issues around equity and inclusion. And she's also an adjunct professor. The, the commanding officer of the Office of Equity and Inclusion is Inspector Raimundo Mundo. He served in both the three board precinct and PSA 5 is the commanding officer. And he showed his commitment and willingness to work to, with the diverse communities of both of those precincts. And lastly, our director of evaluation, I'm, I'm sorry, our director of training Director Cruz Tapia has over 30 years of experience with the department and, is, and has served in a number of roles and is very committed to outreach and to awareness around issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what do I look for? I look for knowledge, awareness, passion, commitment to drive forward the changes that need to happen in the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Of course, we examine you know, prior history with the department and experience and other um, you know, jobs. And, and so we consider all of that when we make decisions on who is on the team in the equity, in the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Thank you for that answer. And the, the, the backgrounds that you just laid out for me are stellar backgrounds. Um, deserving of leadership status. Was James, James Coble's background equal to any of the representation that you just gave me of leadership? So when I joined OEI, as I mentioned before, Inspector Coble had been there for several years and he had taken part in many of the initiatives that we have driven forward as an agency to, make, to be committed to EEO and equity and inclusion. His employment background with the NYPD, as I mentioned, there was, there was no indication prior to this most recent one that he, assuming it is him, had the thoughts and ideas and viewpoints that has been expressed by Cluso. So, so how then, would one's performance be judged in these units, in, in OEI or EEO? How would their performance be judged or measured? If, I assume you're referring to the executive team? Yes. So in terms of executive staff, then we all work together as a team to provide feedback to each other on a regular basis. We are very much team-centered in our office and I also am in a position to evaluate each of my employees throughout the course of, of their time in OEI and EEO. Okay, so let, let me just move on then. Once the disclosure of the behavior of James Coble became uh, um, apparent, shall we say, uh, the, the way that this message board um, has been portrayed today is that one that has pretty much been under the radar. Uh, we know it's there for about a decade or so, and we're just, you know, letting it, letting it happen, letting the comments go on and on. 
I, I'm just curious as we sit here today, have any changes been made to the monitoring practice of that particular message board or really any other message boards that, uh, that the NYPD is aware of um, and participation uh, like this? Is there any further monitorization or another level perhaps of monitorization? And I'm, I'm saying because I know that there is monitorization of the internet when it comes to gang penetration, when it comes to the way that we look at now, especially with the proliferation of gun violence out there, we take a look at the gangs and we take a look at them under microscope Got, uh, under a microscope, really, to NYPD's credit, uh, it, when we take a look at their behavior, where they're going, the music they're listen, listening to and everything else, to get to the bottom of where they're going tomorrow. So I just want to be clear and understand what the NYPD is doing now that we know about this message board, now that we know the damage that it's done, now that we know that there may be others who are quite frankly, under the radar. I have no doubt about that, by the way. Um, what are we doing now? Is there a level, the same type of level in monitoring this, this message board and others like it, the way that NYPD monitors, let's say, the gang message boards? So, to my knowledge, the, 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 the message board has been taken down. At least. Down. Yes. Uh, and so, I don't know if it'll come back up, but I, I believe it's taken down as of now. Okay, well, that's good news. So, so let me follow up with this. What, I, I just heard my colleague ask about um, Sergeant Mull, Mullins. He's got a history of bad behavior. We know that, you know that. Um, what exactly are the parameters for the NYP to, investigate, to initiate investigations uh, of explicit hater bias? What are your parameters? Because we, we, we're, we're hearing that you didn't know that there was an investigation going on with that regard. Um, there are other quote unquote bad apples in the barrel. What are, what are we doing exactly uh, to get to the bottom of this? We, we've got um, so much going on and so much work to do. I, I just wanna get a feel for what the parameters are for the bad behavior? How is it rooted out proactively instead of reactively? Well, you, you're talking about Mullins and you're talking about the cup? Yes, you, I am. Yeah, I well, am. A lot of again. us know what, what that cup implicated and what it means and what it stands for and all those things. Uh, and to, you know, to hear that it's just like, oh, business as usual, it's disturbing to me. Well, again, I, I think as, as, as Commissioner Janowski pointed out, when it comes to the, the conduct, what it really, the real question is, just because you see a cup in, in the same space as you see the individual, doesn't it necessarily suggest that this person is an endorser of that particular, whatever that is on the cup. So I don't know that we started an investigation about that. Commissioner, do you, do you believe that? Do, do you really believe that? That if I have something in my background, in, in my workspace, or my, 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 where I am now in my home workspace, that if I, I don't know, see, I don't know where he was. I don't, I don't know where he was when this, this photograph was taken. I don't know what the context of it was at all. So I, I'm only speaking to you from, from what I know, what my knowledge base is right now. But I'm suggesting that if it's, I don't know, if the cup's on the table and I'm sitting here, this bottle of big wind water that is attributable to me and that that's like say something about how I feel about this water and am I endorsing it? Not necessarily so. So, uh, you know, I think when we're talking about investigations, I mean, you know, there, there's, a, there's a way to go about making determinations as to whether an investigation has merit and you should pursue it, um, but not on a whim. I mean, we don't ever go into investigations on you know that way. So all I'm suggesting is that you know if 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 in fact uh, you know he was heard to endorse this organization, then that certainly brings us into the purview of what our rules and regulations suggest in the patrol guide about officer members of the service conduct, and we can certainly yeah. look into that. And we would. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. 
Yeah, I, I'm only asking because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get down to the bottom of, you know, history and histories of bad behavior. And maybe we can stop things from happening before they get to a certain level. So we're looking at the history of bad behavior in one instance when it comes, you know, to, to that individual. When we take a look at, at James Coble, um, along the same lines, do we know whether or not he engaged in any conduct or made any statements during his career that may have revealed hateful or explicitly biased views the way that we know that uh, Sergeant Mullins has? No, I, I'm saying to you that that Mullen, I mean, uh, Coble has not, as I said, I thought pretty clearly earlier that, that there was nothing in his background to suggest that he is, if he's this guy, then, then he's, that's serious. I mean, and, and, it, and, it, and it has implications for the way in which as, and, and what we've learned during the investigation. So yeah. I can't go into all of that or any of that, yeah. Yeah. to be honest. But, but, but and, and as I said, um, we are getting, you know, we're getting to the point where we'll be able to make a determination definitively, which is what we want to do before we take action. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. What we should do. Okay. And so we're pursuing it mm -hmm. that way. And we're not going to rest on our laurels. Um, I know, I know, I know, I uh, know. Currently, Councilman uh, uh, Councilmember Torres thinks that we will, but we won't. Um, and uh, so, that's all I'll say. I mean, we we will okay. we will act when we when we need to. And trust me, if it is this individual, we will act swiftly and 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 in a, in a very serious manner. Okay, I, I understand. I, I guess that my frustration is that it seems that we, we are talking in sense, again, of reactive measure, and we're not really speaking in sense of proactive measure. Um, there are things that, that can be done. There, there, are, there are ways to, to protect the institution, if you will, um, that I, I just don't see um, going on, especially in this. We've got, we've got the office, we've got OEI, we've got people in place to, to handle situations, but it seems to me that it, it's after the fact. And, and I'd like to just hear some more of what's happening to prevent um, more James Cobles, because I frankly believe that there are more out there that you don't see um, that are having a significant impact and that are taking those feelings with them on the job on a daily basis as we speak right now, that are influencing their partner's behavior and uh, influencing what goes on in our communities throughout the city of New York. I happen to believe that. So, so I would just like to have more of a comfort level of what the NYPD is doing proactively to number one, get these people off the force, get, this, get things turned around, um, and moving in a more positive area so that we can kind of change some things. And I'm sure you, you would like to do that as well. So um, no just like no more question. comfort level to know what's going on proactively. Well, if, if you know, you, you, you say influences, um, that's a, an active word. And so for me, if, 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 if I'm engaging in conduct that, that, that is suggests that I'm trying to recruit or pull people in that direction that is it doesn't even need to be that i'm not even going that deep i'm speaking about subliminal messages even i've got a degree in psychology things can happen in my speech that can influence somebody else in a moment's notice i know that and everybody knows that everybody has has the gift of, of speaking things that influence other people without necessarily being that blatant about it and saying hey come with me do this and join that so i i'm, I'm talking along those lines I think, Council Member, if I, if I may, I, I sure. think a number of the initiatives that Commissioner Meisenholder mentioned in her opening comments, which uh, you know I'll defer back to her to add to to further um, elaborate on, are proactive steps. The discipline matrix and the level of severity, the escalation in the level of severity with which we would treat such comments if we find them and if we prove them is something that's prospective in the sense of, yes, it's reactive when we actually find out that it happens, but by putting out this matrix and, and putting such a severe penalty on it, it acts as a deterrent effect prospectively to prevent people from actually engaging in this type of behavior. I think they're thinking about it. But Commissioner, I, I think, um, did you? Did yeah, you thank you um, for the question. 
So in terms of EEO as an agency, there are numerous efforts that we make in order to ensure our employees understand their rights and responsibilities um, around EEO. So all of our employees receive EEO training, which talks about the laws um, surrounding EEO, the expectations for our employees around that. They also receive training in sexual harassment and in EEO 16, which um, involves single sex facilities. There are a number of discretionary training opportunities that we have as well. We also can take part in training that DCAS offers around unconscious bias, inclusive behavior and the like, we take part in those as well. And as I mentioned, our EEO investigators are Cornell certified in EEO investigations. That's an important thing that everyone should recognize. In terms of the work that we're doing in equity and inclusion, Commissioner Tucker mentioned implicit bias training and we've trained all of our uniform workforce in implicit bias. We also went a step further and we worked with partners in academia to evaluate that training. We are now considering what the, the next iteration of that training looks like. In addition, we've recently are in the middle of implicit bias training for our civilian workforce. That is something that we're working on as well. We are taking efforts to address bias in other ways. For instance, we are soon going to start training referred to as ABLE, so active bystander in law enforcement. So that is something that PD is investing in that provides our employees with the opportunity to have peer and peer to peer reinforcement of issues that they see when they come up. So these are all preventive measures that we're taking. And I'd also like to, to remind everyone of some of the things that I mentioned in our testimony in terms of the employee forums that we're having on race and law enforcement. These are critical discussions that really focus on very difficult um, topics. It, you know, and one actionable item that's come out of that thus far is that we are in the process of creating a curriculum for our most recent recruit class on race and law enforcement. We are also thinking about training in terms of sub subtle acts of exclusion, or sometimes people refer to that as microaggressions. So beyond everything that we are doing in EEO, we are also doing a number of things in OEI, and, and that list was not exhaustive. Um, in, short, in order to move the agency forward in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. I, I just have a couple more questions. Then I'll I'll um, we'll, we'll I'll go back to the chair and we'll let our colleagues in here. Do, do you do do any uh, any of you consider um, a, a person like James Coble rare um, in the position that he was in at that level um, of management? Do you consider him rare? In what respect, when you say rare? In, in, the, re in, in the respect that there um, are probably not more like him at that level in that unit. In, in that unit? Yes. Uh, well, I don't, I don't think we have any reason to suspect or believe that there are any others there, that any other people, not only there, but elsewhere in the department that, that are exhibiting that same type of of behavior, um, but we, we we don't know that. Uh, but I think it's it's fair to say, if you're talking about EEO, that that based on the descriptions of the personnel that that uh, Tanya just uh, recited, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely not. I would say, uh, and so yeah, I mean, you shouldn't assume that that because of because he exists, that that uh, that there, there are others like him, and there may be, but we don't know that. Okay. And then Everyone. remember, I mean, again, he he was someone who would not have been on our radar, almost ever, but for but for this, uh, you know, the, the uh, surfacing on the on the on that site. Okay. And I guess my final question will just take the department in general. How does the department actually handle accusations of officers who associate with groups that espouse hateful uh, ideologies or those who may have a history 
of explicitly racist, misogynistic, or other hateful conduct? To the extent that we become aware of it. Yes. And, and then we would yeah. look into it, we would investigate it, and we would hold them accountable because uh, we have rules uh, that clearly prevent them or suggest that they not be engaged in any kind of activities as such as those that you, that you just uh, uh, described. I guess I'll Again, you know, yeah. serious, very serious, and, 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 and we will deal with them um, based on what the presumptive penalties um, provide. And, and they, that would be very serious. And, and depending on the facts, obviously, in, in each case, um, ultimately, termination would be, there's no place for anyone like that in this agency, providing the services that we try to provide and have to provide for, for the citizens of the city. So yeah, if anyone, if we learn that that's the case, we're gonna pursue it and we will hold them accountable. We have in the past and we will continue to do that. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I may have a second round, but thank you very much for your testimony. And again, it's very nice to see the three of you today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, chairs. I will now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced you may begin before asking your questions. Now we'll take a look to see if any council members have any raised hands on Zoom. I don't believe anybody else does. Uh, chairs, do you have any follow-up questions? Do give me a moment. Sure. Actually, we have a question from Council Member Miller, if you want to take that first. Council Member Miller? Time starts now. I'm, I'm simultaneously uh, two hearings and whatever, I've got three different events going on. And I, I guess my hand was raised in the wrong place, but certainly um, I, I, I want to have several questions and 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 first one would be um as a matter of collective bargaining clearly uh uh that dictates uh any form of discipline that happens and and I, and I know you said that there's ongoing investigations but um is there anything in collective bargaining given the given the severity of 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 uh the implications here uh, to prevent um, the deputy inspector from being taken out of service? Uh, Council member, could you, I missed the last part of what you said. Is there anything to prevent the deputy inspector from being removed from services, from service now? Yes, I mean, we, we haven't determined. Um, we, we engaged in an investigation as soon as we concluded will make a decision about what the penalties and if, if he's found so, to so according engage to the, in. according to the collective bargaining agreement, what actions would allow which would force or, or permit an officer or anyone to be removed from service immediately? Clearly, there, there are a few things that, that say that, you know, irregardless of the investigation, the, the, considering the severity of, of, of the charges, that they're, they're removed from service. Well, I, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm, the reason I'm, I'm this is one of them. Police officers, police officers are no less uh, in, 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 uh, uh, entitled to due process than anyone else. Is, so, is this one of them? Um, the, uh, uh, it's good to see you, uh, Commissioner. Is but is this in the interest of time? Is this one of those situations that uh, he could have been removed from service? No, 
no, no, no. I mean, he, he due process no. applies. Due process applies across the board. I mean, we can't cherry pick. You can't decide that we're going to. And, and so we don't make unilateral decisions in, 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 in haste. Does the collective bargaining agree? Yeah. Does that allow that to happen? Is this an anomaly that you can't just fire someone that, that, that you feel strongly enough from public reactions or whatever the actions was or whatever uh, they've done that stealing? If, if, if you get caught stealing, you get if, if you, you, you're in a bad shoot in the case there, or is there anything that that someone could be fired for immediately or immediately taken out of service to immediately suspend it pending? If you engage what, what, in what does collective bargaining allow you to do other than transfer this guy? Because that seems to be really nothing. Well, so just just to to go back um, to to Kobo and and I guess the, 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 in terms of, of your interest in, in sort of what can we do, uh, we have done what we thought and believe we could do um, in light of an allegation or a series of allegations about his conduct. Uh, and what we've done is, in large part, because of his position in EEO as the CEO of that of that sensitive assignment, we modified it. And, and we do that often with officers. We take them out okay. of play uh, and, 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 and then pending our investigation and information that we get, we would then move along in the process, assuming he, we determine okay. that he is, and then we would move forward. Okay. But again, that's all part of, of due process. That's I, all part I, of. I, I, Okay, I, I I tend to disagree. I think that 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 the law and collective and as well as collective bargaining allow for uh, more aggressive actions to be taken. Uh, but clearly, that's that that is consistent with the department considering it took five years to bring Candelero to 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 trial, right? Um, do you aggregate discipline by by race and and, and gender? Of course not. What do you mean, Court? Like, could you? Are you saying that do we use race and gender? No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying, how do you do? You keep that data by race and gender. Who's di who's disciplined by gender? How, you know, what percentage? Ignore the time limit. It, 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 do do we? That information yes. is not available. Who, who, people who get complaints. Is that what you're talking about? Who get about? disciplined? Get disciplined. Or disciplined. Officers and, and, and executives and supervisors that are disciplined, do we aggregate that by, by, by race or gender? Yes, we do. We track that. We have it. Is, 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 is a, uh, do you also do it by rank? What is the likelihood well, yeah. that, it, 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 so what we're trying to determine if, if, if this deputy inspector is being treated any differently from an uh, officer, uh, well, not by, by virtue of what you're saying, but what the data tells us. Well, he's being treated just like anyone else. That's, that's my whole point about the process, the due process. That's, I, I, but, but I'm sorry, again, Commissioner, my, my, my point is, does the data support what you're saying in terms of discipline, uh, how many folks are being disciplined by race, by gender, by rank? Uh, and, and is this behavior an aberration because of his rank, because his race? And, and because I find it very concerning that someone responsible for the very activities that oversee maintaining the dignity of the department and its workforce is carrying out such behavior. I also find it very hard to believe that no one saw this coming. And in fact, while we're on that, did, did you know him personally? Does anybody on the panel know this, have a relationship or, or know them? Obviously, uh, someone worked with him directly. Well, Commissioner Feisenholder can speak to it, but but I will say, as I said earlier, uh, there's no nothing to suggest that that um, in in in, in Di Koval's um, um, case that he was somehow this person 
but we now believe we do. There was nothing. I, I find nothing. that so absolutely Background. hard to believe. I, I just well, I, 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 so, so do I, we. Because people live these alternative lives in that way. And what kind of, so he was removed, his subordinates, anyone else in that department, uh, were there any other reorgs that happened? Because clearly there has to be an audience to receive this type of nefarious language and behavior. He wasn't active, he, he, he wasn't operating in, in, in a silo. He was operating within a site that is 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 visited by many members of the department. Uh, we have see something, say something. Like clearly, I, I, it, it, to say that somebody knew would be ridiculous. Everybody knew that the dude was operating in this in in this site here. How how do we not know? And how do we? What steps have been taken to prevent it from happening? Beyond moving him, have we begun to look at all those around him? Well, I, I think I think your assumptions are probably too broad. I don't think that everybody knows. I don't think many people know. Um, if any, uh, he, he he you just if if he is that person. If he's actually, if we once we complete this investigation, if he's that person, no one, no one suspected. Uh, and I think, you know, even with with um, the modification, now that it, you know, that's certainly people know he's been modified and removed from his position. Folks, I think comments have been, you know, I couldn't believe it, I can't believe it. How could that be? Yeah, that's that's an sort of that, that's an indictment on an investigation agency that. That is a serious indictment that no one knew that potentially this guy harbored these type of feelings. Uh, uh, you, I, I don't think anybody like that I, I even in the world that we live in. I would also submit that um, the department should probably take I, a significant portion of investigations that occur in street crimes and in crimes happen happens in chat rooms, right? Uh, significant, uh, th there is so much activity that the police department is engaged in, in investigations and pre-employment. Why wouldn't you then continue to monitor social media? And, and, and I get that there's, you know, there's, there's all kinds of infringements and rights and stuff like that, but we know that this is where these activities happen, right? Why wouldn't the department monitor social media when you monitor everybody else's? We do monitor social media. You didn't monitor this. You didn't monitor this. Well, I, I think here's what I know. I also know that we had a, a local inspector who who was a little uh, aggressive to say the least. And, and was forced to shut his site down, right? So clearly there's a, the, the department recognizes that this type of behavior occurs. How did he get away with it? How, how, how did he get away with it when I know that there was a, clearly a, a supervisor, in fact, at the same rank, happened to be a person of color, didn't matter because he was out of order as well and was forced to shut his site down. Just shut it down and he he was just going over the top. He didn't offend people in this way. How do we not know that the person that is charged with this oversight is operating even beyond that behavior is, is beyond me. That, that and what, and, and I'm gonna close with this, what have you done to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Well, I think council member, you know, I think we, we would all love to have some sort of a crystal ball where we can preempt these things before they happen, you know, to, and we do try, I think, based on commissioner Meisenholder's response to chair Adams, you know, and the processes we've put in place, the matrix, 
with uh, the heightened penalties for uh, this kind of activity, the various programs, the listening groups, the focus groups within the department, the various training that we do, it is all meant to, to, to avoid having this sort of scenario happen. But I, I think, you know, like any corporation, like whether it's the council itself or whether any organization, including the police department, that's of this size, uh, it is, it, it's not um, unforeseen that you may find somebody that flies under the radar if in fact this is an employee that flies under the radar and there were no signs. Now, you're, you talked about uh, the individual having a forum. I mean, clearly on that particular platform, that was certainly a forum. It was an individual masking themselves under a pseudonym that was spewing hate speech that none of us denied, that all of us find abhorrent, that effectively insulted each one of us on this panel with respect to the various groups that we belong to. Uh, I, I just think that, you know, sometimes it is possible that somebody doesn't exhibit any kind of signs to their coworkers, but is li living a life and having views that we ultimately become aware of. And we all use hindsight and we wish that we were aware of it sooner and we took action sooner, but short of having any kind of evidence or having any kind of signs that could lead us to that conclusion, uh, I think the right judgment is what we should be judged on or any organization should be judged on. What do you do when you actually find out rather than a judgment on why didn't you see something that it appears to be there were no signs that we could have seen and no flags that could have been raised. I think the right call now is, you know, now that we do know what is the process that we go through? How do we identify who this is? How do we confirm? How do we, how do, we do a process that is a solid process that could withstand scrutiny on the back end? So if we are to take discipline in this particular case, that discipline is not overturned under judicial scrutiny. And I think that's really the, the approach that we're trying to take and we were presented with a very comprehensive set of uh, uh, information and documentation by uh, Chair Torres. I, I think the work that his committee and his staff and he has done is commendable. Uh, this information was brought to us. Now we can use that information and follow some additional leads and get uh, some additional, serve some additional subpoenas. There is technology involved in the case. So if we can build a much more solid case that's gonna withstand scrutiny, that's what our aim is to do. And I don't think we're far off from concluding. I, you know what, I appreciate it. And obviously Commissioner Oleg and, and, and Chris, we have worked together for so long. We, we have the utmost respect here, but I, I am thoroughly disappointed, just absolutely disappointed that of the naivety that happens there, that this is not just cultural conditioning, that, 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 that this is not acceptable. Uh, we see it day in and day out. You see it as civilians. You see it internally. People know, and, and you need to put your ear to the ground that folks know that there are groups operating within the department, operating within the city. Um, and, and quite frankly, you, you know, we can't always do it, but it has to be absolutely unacceptable. And, and the behavior of once someone has been caught doing it or even perceived to be caught doing it, that there are immediate consequences and actions that have to be taken. When that doesn't happen, it, it, it kind of just, you know, it, it promotes business as usual. And, and we continue to see that. And, and, and I'm disappointed. And, and whether it's here or, or the FDNY, which is this 4.0, uh, we will continue to investigate it. I want to commend the chair for his due diligence and the work that has been done on this issue because it's absolutely unacceptable. And we will. We absolutely will continue to publish findings and make sure that agencies are being held accountable because it appears now that, you know, at, at best you, you, you want to do something, but I, I would expect a stronger actions to be taken. And, and we've seen it and, and we've waited, we've waited five years you know, for the firing of Pandolero. And without this to happen, this is what we're going to continue to see. And, and, and that is just unacceptable. And, and, and we, I, I, and I know many of my colleagues were very, very hopeful 
that there, there was a, a change coming, but we're, we're certainly not seeing that change. So thank you well, Chair, for, for the time, uh, particularly uh, Chair Adams, it's great to see you in the seat. And, and, and certainly I'm, I'm gonna sit here and, and, and uh, continue to absorb and, and, and we will continue to make ourselves available to work with the department, but I'm, I'm, I'm greatly disappointed at what I'm hearing this afternoon. Thank you, Council Member Miller. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Cohen. If any other Council Members have questions to ask, please use the Zoom raise hand function at this time. Council Member Cohen, you may begin. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Now. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioners, it's good to see you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I, yeah, before I ask a tough question, I, I do wanna take a, a moment, and obviously in your testimony, it was clear, but. I, I, I am keenly aware that there has been tremendous progress uh, in uh, bringing the NYPD into the 21st century. Um, when I go to uh, precinct council meetings or, or when people come to my office with issues with NYPD, you know, I, I point out that when, when I took office, there was not a, there were no officers with, you know, body cameras. Now uh, they're universal among uh, the patrol um, uh, I've gone to the academy, I've gone to graduations, I've seen how incredibly diverse the incoming officers are. Uh, so I am keenly aware of it. And to be honest, but that brings me to the point of my problem is that I don't think the issues are particularly with the officers. I think there are systemic failures here. Uh, as the chair brought up, uh, that these message boards and chat rooms, like. This is going on in the NYPD and the NYPD is not aggressively monitoring it, not going after it, not pursuing it, not trying to root it out. Um, and that's really, I think, uh, the problem is, and when you fail to take these kinds of actions, ultimately it's the rank and file officer who's left holding the bag. They're the one who's criticized on the street for this detective's conduct. And he's not a lone actor. Uh, my, my, my first question is, how many other people are under investigation for this kind of conduct? I don't know. Yeah, I don't think we, we have that, that number. That, but yeah. I mean, I, I should, you know, I, I know this is not really in response to your question, but I, I should have interrupted you before you asked the question. You know, I, I wanted to echo the, the the first deputy commissioner's comments on working with uh, Chair Torres and and Chair Adams, and you know the fact that you know um, with Chair Torres, it'll, our collaboration in this capacity is going to be greatly missed. But I certainly didn't want to forget you, uh, Council Member um, Cohen, and I know that you're going to be leaving us as well. And I think that you know we truly cherish. You know the work that we certainly did together, and I think the uh, bench is going to be uh, greatly served. Uh, criminal justice as a system is going to be greatly served by having you there. So uh, our loss is their gain. I appreciate but, uh, it. You know when I what I'm asking, I, I'm asking from a place of sincerity. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely understand. But I unfortunately I don't have that number, but I will get that number for you. Can can, can you give me a hint though? Is it five people? Ten people? I mean. This seems, you know, I've read the news accounts. This seems to be a, a problem within the ranks. I don't know how many people are. I don't know how many people are engaged in it. But if there was somebody plotting, you know, uh, terrorism on chat boards, you would you would know. This is this is serious because it undermines the public's faith in the NYPD, and that is of paramount concern to you and to me. So I no, I agree. That part we could absolutely agree with. But I mean, I, I think it's important to echo what the first step said in the beginning in response to I think an exchange with Chair Flores. There, there is extreme difficulty in investigating such cases. So first yeah. of all, I know we're all focused on this particular uh, message board, but there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of such boards out there. And this is to give context to the first steps uh, comments and, and response to the, chair, the chair Flores. What these individuals do is nobody clearly posts under their own name. Nobody posts a picture of themselves. This is not, this is a lot different than for example, uh, investigating- the And no, but the terrorists, don't, the terrorists don't post under their own name either. And you're able to, to investigate right. and monitor what they do. But, 
again, if what you have is if you have somebody on a terrorist, Keith, I can see I'm not equating the two, by the way. I'm just saying. I, I, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. They're very different. But I think yes. the in, in the context of terrorism, if you have somebody advocating for mass destruction or a, a mass shooting or any kind of terrorist act, what happens is you're able to then focus your resources on that one individual that's posting it, determine who that individual is, where the post is coming from, and do your, your trace that way. What you're talking about here is monitoring tens of thousands of message boards for hate speech, which unfortunately, really unfortunately, is not uncommon uh, on these various message boards, but then investigating each and every piece of hate speech to determine who the speaker is or not they're, they're an active member of the service. That's the difficulty in the use of resources. And that's, I guess, to answer uh, Chair Torres's question, uh, you know, that, that was the difficulty in conducting these investigations and having large um, uh, mass surveillance of chat rooms to try to determine which of those uh, individuals are active members of the service. Those are the difficulties in doing it. Certainly, when we do become aware of it, where we dedicate the resources in fully vetting that lead and determining whether, whether that individual is in fact an active member of the service. And certainly we calibrated our discipline system in order to punish that individual in a much more severe way than they may have historically been punished. And certainly we're taking proactive steps to train our members of service in appreciating the diversity of, of our culture and the, and the city um, that they serve in. Uh, and that hopefully is gonna educate them and serve as a deterrent and um, to having such sort of thoughts. Yeah, I appreciate that, Sharon. And just, if you could ultimately let me know how many uh, other members of the NYPD are under investigation for posting, making posts that are inconsistent with being a police officer. It doesn't have to be exactly uh, uh, the, the same nature as, as this. I, I would be interested in knowing that. Uh, and I'd also be interested in knowing it, you know, when you talk about resources, if you could at some point tell us what the resources are devoted to uh, trying to root out this kind of behavior. And Thank Councilman, you. I can I can give you some data just on just on offensive language that's that 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 uh, complaints that go to CCRB, for example. So so um, in you know, and complaints generally are down um, like twenty five percent. Uh, against members of the service, you know, uniform members of the service or other members of the service. Uh, but offensive language complaints, we have 276 in, in 2019. Uh, and and uh, that was down, uh, 276 this year, down 10% uh, from what it was at this time in 2019. Uh, and uh, historically, only about 4.5% of the complaints and only about two to three percent of the allegations uh, are what consist of these 200, the, the, you know, are, are what um, uh, uh, gets investigated. Uh, that, and that's what the complaints look like. Uh, either complaints on uh, uh, the, 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 the instance that the, the complaint is made, and then it has two or three allegations per, per, per complaint. The, Overall, the trend is downward. So over the last 10 years, allegations of, of offensive language have come down. Um, the most common allegations um, it, uh, are race and gender. 30% of, of allegations roughly about race, comments uh, about race, and 30% uh, uh, around gender. Uh, the, um, in terms of the, the, the uh, substantiation of those complaints, 15% uh, uh, are, uh, are substantiated, 34% are exonerated, which means that whatever the conduct is that was alleged to have been within this category uh, was, was found to be appropriate or proper. And 11% and are unfounded, uh, which means that they, they just, um, it didn't happen uh, as far as the uh, CCRB was concerned. Uh, but that's just one slice of, of the way in which we would look at, at these, obviously, but just to give you some context. As long as you have it open, and I'm sorry if I'm uh, abusing my time, uh, what, what were the, the range of punishments in the 15% in the, in the that were substantiated? I, I, don't have the, I don't have the punishments. I just have the, the raw data okay. that I just, uh, I can get that for you. But, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but, but the, but, um, 
That's just a snapshot. Th thank you very much. I, I will say, I, I do appreciate it. I feel like I, I have had a good partnership with the NYPD over my time in office, and I'm very grateful for that partnership. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Sir. Are there any other council members with questions? If so, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. If not, I will now turn it back to the chairs for any further questions. Chairs Torres and Adams. Uh, thank you. Uh, I know, Commissioner, when I had asked you about QAnon, um, you said you were unaware of it and you were unaware of any investigation into QAnon and, and Sergeant Mullins. Um, it was brought to my attention that in August of 2019, Yahoo News wrote the following article with the following headline, FBI document warns conspiracy theories are a new domestic terrorism threat. And the document, which is the subject of the article, uh, specifically identifies uh, QAnon as one of those conspiracy movements. I, I also want to just correct the record. I know you indicated that the law enforcement rant board has been shut down. I, I was informed by the council's investigators that it's at, it hasn't been shut down. It's been reconstituted as a new board. So it has the same name, but it has a different hosting company. I'm going to have my team uh, send you the, the link to the new website. Oh, thank um, you. If you know, suppose you unmask the identity of an officer who has engaged in hate speech online and you hold the officer accountable. Uh, is the M NYPD willing to commit to reviewing the past work of that officer, their past arrests, their past testimony, um, all their, really all their functions as a police officer? Well, it depends on, on the, the nature of the complaint, obviously, because uh, not everything that that office has done necessarily would reflect some outward, some something that was you would suggest was connected directly to the sentiment that that this officer uh, espoused. Uh, so don't know. So I couldn't say at this moment that yes, we would look, but if there was some reason to, um, but I would much prefer to 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 deal with it uh, from a more preventive measure and and do the kinds of things that we that we are engaged in in terms of trying to uh, hold officers accountable when we learn of that conduct number one number two um, try and prevent it from happening in the first place or minimize it reduce it not don't know whether you could ever eliminate it uh, because of the nature of, of this conduct and uh, and so forth so um, but there, there might be cases where and certainly and I will say in Cobalt's case, <laughs> We, uh, we did, one of the first things we did was, uh, you know, I'm, I handle discipline. So I always look back at the officer's records. I wanna know, because that helps you understand, number one, it goes to how you might handle the instant case that you're looking at uh, from a punishment, from a penalty perspective. Um, and if you look at our matrix, um, you know, it, it sets these parameters, these productive penalties, but we can rely on mitigating and, and, and ag aggregating uh, factors as well to determine. And some of the aggravating factors uh, may be the, the, the officer's past history, and so might uh, the mitigating factors um, often uh, also is, is part of uh, decision making, particularly uh, in cases where, uh, you know, we're talking um, the conduct is very serious, and, and is there anything that, that suggests that this officer um, that the, the number of days, for example, that were taken instead of being 12 days might be four days or five days, things like that may come into play. But, but that's very rare um, in, in the most serious of cases, which this is. And, and so we're not interested in, in um, uh, it, you know, the conduct speaks for itself and it's so heinous that, that if in fact, as I mentioned to you earlier, this is, it turns out to be this individual, we will pursue it and, and pursue it to the fullest extent um, and, and up to and including termination. I just want a, a little more clarity. If, if if you have a patrol officer who mm -hmm. you know has arrested people and has testified against people, and it is found that that patrol officer is the kind of bigot that Clouseau has been exposed to be, um, would is the NY, would the NYPD commit to reviewing the record of that officer? It's not unreasonable that that we that we might. 
Um, and, and, and it may be, you know, we might even have a conversation, you know, with, with the DAs uh, involved in those cases. Uh, who knows? I mean, it, it may be that we do. But I, Commissioner, I don't mean to pressure you, but you, would be, yeah. you said it's not unreasonable. I mean, it would be, is, that a, is that a yes? Or? Yeah, it would be on a case by case basis. I, I think it's the, the proper way to, you know, we wouldn't, it's not as if I'm saying to you, no, we're not ever going to do that. We might. I can, I can envision a, a circumstance where we would. And I know you, you acknowledged earlier that the NYPD had no history of monitoring these online message boards or history of investigating the hate speech of officers on these message boards. Um, is the NYPD willing to make a practice of monitoring these message boards and willing to make a practice uh, investigating, if necessary, the hate speech on these message boards to see if it you know, you know, I, I think what what I you know I also oversee risk management, and I and I think I'm I'm going to have what I will commit to is having a conversation with with Deputy Commissioner Schlanger, who who oversees risk management, because it is, I think, uh, worth a conversation in, along those lines. We've done an, an enormous amount with respect to early intervention uh, uh, through through risk management. Uh, it has been a much more robust operation in looking at ways to prevent certain activities, but also to identify um, gaps and, and conduct of officers uh, and to be able to, to identify those, you know, those acts in uh, any kind of misconduct, um, certainly generating civilian complaints or engaged in other kinds of conduct that might be more serious uh, uh, and rise above uh, 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 you know, statements and may have to do with force or something like that. We we always look at those things, and so I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'll be having a conversation just to think about what what else we might do, um, and what uh, you know. The point here is, I think, as a practical matter, it is a resource issue, and 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 because of the nature of uh, these folks uh, having uh, not using their real identities and and. Uh, that makes it, I think, a bit of a challenge. And so, you know, I don't know. I wasn't, you know, I, I mentioned resources because I think it's real, and so particularly in this, in the nature, in the current climate. Uh, uh, so I think we have to be realistic about just what we do and when we do it, and under what circumstances, and based on information that we have. I don't think that's unreasonable. I think it makes sense. Uh, but listen, we, uh, I think the one thing we can certainly all agree on here is that what we said in both of our testimony, uh, this, this, this conduct is, is it, this, this is outrageous. And, and it, is, it is the kind of thing that, you know, police work is about gaining the legitimacy of, of you know, acting in a way that, that you gain the respect and, and, and acting, gain the legitimacy and is seen as legitimate in the eyes of the public, of the people we serve. And, and this is the kind of thing that, that, that you know, for the 36,000 officers out there who put their lives on the line every day doing what they do, um, this is, they are trying to get it done. And they're trying to do what's right. I think most cops will get out of bed in the morning and, and you know, put on their shoes and go to work and, 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 and put the uniform on. I think they do it because they want to keep the city safe. And I don't think, um, and there's no place for people, if, if it is this inspector, there is no place for him in this job. And we find officers that there's no place for them in this job for a whole host of other reasons as well. And what we do, we, we, we get rid of them. Um, and that's no less true, and certainly in cases like this. So um, so I listen, I, I appreciate that you had this, this hearing, uh, give us the opportunity to have this conversation, uh, particularly since you know, I think that, that, that you know that the history that the department over this last seven years, uh, and, and you know, Council Member Cohen referenced it uh, a bit, uh, has been, you know, really, you know, focused on uh, continuous improvement, but, but doing things that, that uh, with, with, with body one cameras, with overhauling the, the discipline system to make it more uh, effective. Uh, which is what the matrix, um, the division that, that the council had uh, for that has now been realized. And, and on, in January, the, the matrix will be posted and I, and I think we'll get better uh, um, 
results. Uh, we, we, we've, we've gotten some of those results unilaterally and changes that we made with respect to officers engaged in domestic violence or, or, or driving while intoxicated. And those penalties have been severe and many of them uh, ultimately could lead to termination and some do and have. Um, so I think we, we, we are not blind or deaf to, to, to the notions of, of fairness and equity, but also uh, recognizing that, that we have to be vigilant about uh, the kinds, these kinds of concerns uh, and where we can take the steps and the measures, honestly, that we need to do, take, to take. But, but you know, it, with respect to, all due respect to Council Member Miller's comments, I just think we have to also, it, it is, we'd be doing ourselves a, a disservice, all of us, I mean, our officers and the city, uh, ultimately, if we if we go after people um, and and do it in a way that that doesn't respect due process, and we end up um, you know pursuing uh, uh, termination cases that that ultimately backfire, and that is in cases where they go uh, and, and make uh, you know could pursue an, an Article seventy eight, which which in some cases could have um, uh, decisions that send that person back to the to the to the department which is what we don't want, which is why I think we are hyper vigilant about making sure that the case, when we make it and when we make the call, it is as tight as it can be and there's no avenue of, of, of wiggle room um, from as far as we can see. So when this person is, is terminated, they stay terminated. Yeah, I mean, you know, my, my concern is, is, you know, you've been emphatic that there's no room for hate in the police department. Um, but I'm not hearing a clear commitment to monitoring and cracking down on the hate speech of your own officers um, on these online message boards. I know there's a commitment, you said, to a conversation, um, but I believe there should be actual monitoring. And you did mention uh, resource constraints. If there are legal or resource constraints, is the department, is the NYPD willing to call upon an independent entity like the Justice Department uh, to investigate these online message boards where officers are trafficking in hate speech. Well, no, I don't. I don't think. I don't know that justice. We would call them in to do that. I mean, that's it's our responsibility to do the enforcement and to and to do our own but, but investigation. If, if, so if you're telling me, if you're telling me you don't have the resources, then like, who's going to be in charge of investigating and uncovering the identities of officers who are engaged in hate speech and explicit bias? Like, are we simply going to turn a blind eye to it? You're telling me. Well, but, well, first of all, that's not the only resource. That's not the only venue where, where we, it's not as if we're not doing anything in that, on that, in that regard anyway. Um, and, and so we do prosecute, we do hold accountable those officers who engage in that conduct, who we find out about in various ways, um, and, and either through social media or in, in just the way in which they do their job based on the number of complaints that they receive that they have. Um, that kind of impact, whether it's race, gender, or otherwise, uh, those are the kinds of things that that are part of of the work that we get done, and and we have an impact there. And and who's not to say that some of those individuals who 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 we end up pursuing may also have been people who have been on these sites, but we would not necessarily know that. Uh, so all I'm saying to you is, we will take a look uh, about and, and see, but but um, there there are some. Um, some serious concerns right now uh, that I would, um, you know, just hold up uh, rather than say to you, it'd be easy to say to you, oh, yeah, I'm going to commit, we're going to do this and we're going to get it done. Um, I'm not sure um, that that will happen. Uh, we could consider some sort of a pilot to try it and see whether, whether it works and whether we even have any success at identifying individuals. That's a possibility. But I, I you know, at this point, um, I'm not sure, um, you know, that I can be definitive and, and sit here and tell you that that's what we're going to do. Uh, but I certainly would consider the things that I just said to you uh, as, as possibilities, nevertheless. You know, Albert Einstein once said, if you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different results, uh, that's the definition of insanity. Well, that, if we, if we, well let me finish it. If, if just we, a, let me finish it. All. Commissioner, yeah. If we fail to monitor these sites, um, then history can repeat itself. We might have future 
EEO officers who are uh, closeted bigots. Um, I want to ask you a, a broader question. Do you think uh, racism is a problem within the NYPD? Yeah, racism. Racism. My the NYPD is a microcosm of the rest of the city and the society, and so to somehow assume that we don't have people in this agency who who have race problems, uh, it would be ridiculous. So yeah, I mean, this I, I I gave you I gave you a little bit of my history when I came in the job early on in the '60s. Uh, when I came into the department, 95% of this police department were, were white males. That's what it was back in 1969. And, and you had a handful of, of African Americans and Hispanic officers, and a number of those folks went up through the ranks, particularly the African American officers at that time, because they were a, a lot more, a lot bigger population, I think. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I saw racism. I was a victim of of what I believed was racism. Actually, it was, you know, it, uh, it wasn't clear that this officer who assaulted me was, was, um, was a racist, but I knew, but I, I, and in fact, I didn't pursue it and make a complaint. I didn't, you know, uh, uh, my concern was that that circumstance, that, that, that personal circumstance that I was in back in 1973 when this happened, when I was hit and, and injured uh, out of the site that we were dealing with racial tension out in Madison High School, um, I was I was I was less concerned about this officer's motivation as being a racist, and more concerned about the fact that I thought he was unstable, and shouldn't be on the job at all for that reason. Uh, and and the borough commander got got heard that message, and he spoke to me, and he took this officer off patrol, and so forth. I wasn't I wasn't interested. You know, the press were there; they wanted to talk to me about race and racism and all of that. I didn't think that was that wasn't my concern because I after I was struck by him and I was standing six inches from him looking at, looking at, at his, into his eyes I could see that this guy was a problem and I told that to the borough commander I said listen he said what do you want to do man I said hey I said the guy shouldn't be on the street because one of these he's going to kill somebody that's what I said to him so you know I it's not as if I don't get the concerns that we that we all share and but I could also tell you. That that you know that officer ultimately ended off ended up going off the job because I went and I ran CCRB when it was inside the department uh, for for a few years um, uh, uh, in the early '80s and and uh, you know and and I saw all of these these issues and you know we had a backlog and, and of course you, you know, it was inside the department and and that was because it, the only way you can get oversight. To the, to the agency was through uh, some of the deals uh, that, you know, that they made with the unions back in the early 60s and, and, and so forth. But, but it was there, it existed, and, and we tried to improve that process and, and have people in the public be able to rely on the fact that if they made a complaint and filed it with us that we would follow through. And I think we made some improvements there to, to make the place, give it some legitimacy back then. But, uh, but the department, fast forward to where we are today, the agency is, is, is you know, 52%, uh, you know, uh, people of color. Uh, and, and, and so it is a very different organization. Well, to that. I, 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 wanna, I wanna explore that because you made a powerful statement in your testimony. You said something to the effect that it's impossible to ensure fair and impartial policing uh, without diversity. And you're correct in pointing out that there's diversity in the rank and file of the police department, but there's a glaring lack of diversity um, in, in the leadership of the police department. I mean, take the position of, of commissioner. I mean, when was the last time a person of color served as commissioner, was appointed as commissioner of the NYPD? Are you really asking me that question, council member? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, listen, listen, let me, let me just say this. I, I think, you know, no, but I think it's an important point. I mean, I just, 1990. Well, we've got, hold on. Well, we've got, we, well, let me finish, let me finish. We've gone, ahead, go ahead. Well, let me finish, let me finish, Commissioner. Oh, we've go gone ahead. 30 years, Commissioner. We've gone 30 years without a person of color leading the New York City Police Department. So there has been progress, but then there hasn't been. Well, um, this and is according, this and I just want to still, you know, according to the city, in an article written on June 24th by Greg Smith, 
75% of police officials with a rank above captain are white. So the leadership of the NYPD remains overwhelmingly white. It's, you know, one third of the city is white, but two thirds or more than two thirds of your leadership is white. Your leadership is the inverse of the city of New York. Yeah, um, I, I think it's now 60%, not 75%. I don't know when that statistic was, was, was provided, but in any case, I, I think, yeah, I think that's true. Um, that's a whole other discussion and, and, and the neat, you know, Miller would, would, would uh, we've had this discussion many, many times um, in hearings and previous prior hearings, but, uh, and that the challenge there is, and isn't ever the flow to this whole process. I mean, uh, I think we, we're seeing diversity uh, and people coming in, but the, the, the bottom line is when you become a police officer, if you don't take promotion exams, you won't get to the rank of captain. And, and that's why uh, I think at, at, at any given time, um, but I said an ebb and a flow. There are, there are times in which you have uh, a number, a, a lot more African-American, for example, uh, members uh, uh, of, of the service in, in the rank of captain and above. Um, and, and what they do is they age out as well and they move on to other positions. So yeah, but the, the key is to get a, 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 a and, and, and it's funny, we were having this conversation with the commissioner, he is concerned about how we increase, and in particular, black males. When I came to the job, 99% of the department were, 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 were African-Americans, 9%. Uh, we are not that far from that number uh, when it comes to African-American males. Uh, we, we, we usually track now somewhere, correct me if I'm wrong, Tanya, around 15% on average, um, but that's because of black females coming into the job. When I came into the job, you know, women uh, had to sue to take the sergeant's exam just two years before I came on. And, and so things have changed there. You know, we have a number of women who are three-star chief now. And so, and who happen to be not only women, but also, you know, black, Latina, and so forth. And so um, things have, you know, that's a, that's a, 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 a you know, part of the, the, the I think the role uh, that we have is to is to try and in, encourage young people of color to come in, to be willing to come into this agency, uh, become police officers. And, and then, and I, and, when, and I speak to, to young cops all the time, all of the young cops, people of color as well, but, but all the young cops, you know, you come in and you should study, go up through the ranks because, you know, that's how, you know, you get to the leadership positions and that's how you can, can have an impact on, on the way the agency serves, serves the public. Uh, I'm still here for that reason. And, you know, um, I came back, I was gone for 20, 20 something years before I came back in. So um, yeah, uh, do we have, we don't have enough at the top. Um, I will say when, when it comes to uh, Hispanic officers, um, their percentages and, and, and in fact have outpaced African-Americans, um, you know, quite a bit. Uh, and they're really about a 35% of, of the agency. Uh, and, 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 and they're representative, I think, as in the senior ranks is also that way. And I'd say that about Asian officers to some degree as well. Uh, so, so there is some change, uh, not enough, and there's, but there's been extraordinary progress and the profound changes that have, that have occurred in, in the last seven years, in my view, uh, have been just that, unprecedented. And so we're getting, we're moving in the right direction. It's still a work in progress. And I know you said it was a, that's a separate conversation altogether, but I think you know, my, my view is that a lack of diversity in the leadership contributes to what is widely seen as the NYPD's um, blind spot on, on race. Um, I know we've spoken about the leadership. I'm curious now, what's the level of diversity within, I know there's the office of equity and inclusion, which includes the EEL office. How many staffers are in each of those offices? So in the EEOD investigation unit, there are 10 investigators, nine of whom are sergeants, two are black, five are Asian, two are white, and one is Hispanic. And that's the EEL? That's the EEO investigation unit. When you look and at Go ahead. And what's the what are the number of staffers in the um, in your in the office that you lead? 
And overall in OEI, it is 38% Black, 28% White, 19% Hispanic, and 15% Asian. So there's diversity in those offices, there's diversity in the rank and file. Um, yep. We need to see progress in the leadership. And look, I, I'll end on this note. I, I think Councilmember Yeager has questions. I, I have no issue with any of you as individuals. Right? I, I have no doubt about the professional integrity of, of, of Commissioner Tucker and um, Oleg. You know, I've, I've worked with you for these last seven years and I, I consider you the consummate professional and straight shooter. So I think all of you are good people. My issue is with the culture, with the system. Um, I, I respectfully feel that the likes of James Coble for far too long are rarely, if ever, held accountable. And I think if we hold officers accountable for misconduct, uh, we're going to restore our public trust um, in the police department, particularly in communities of color. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. And I want to give Councilmember Yeager an opportunity to ask questions. I'd like to add one more point about the sure. diversity of our workforce that's often overlooked. As I mentioned, we have a tremendous number of civilians in our workforce that we don't talk about often enough. Thank you. I mean, our civilian workforce is 70% female, 50% black, 23% Hispanic, and 13% Asian, 15% white. That is, this is something that needs to be talked about when we talk about the diversity of our workforce, because these are people who are working hard every day in really difficult jobs. They are answering 911 calls. They are in school safety. They are traffic agents. They represent many cultures. And I just, I want people to hear that because it's critically important that we start thinking about our workforce in terms of the entire employee workforce, not just the uniform population. Does Council Member Yeager have questions or? I don't believe any council members have questions, but council okay. members. Have I, thought, I thought you gave, I thought you sent me a note about council member Yeager. During the hearing, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, but if you follow questions or Chair Adams, please proceed. I, I didn't really have uh, any other questions. I think that um, uh, Chair Torres was very thorough. Um, and I particularly like, uh, uh, you know, his, his, uh, last statement there regarding leadership. I think it's very, very important that we um, take a look at that and that we um, you know, pursue that. I, I just wanted to make a note. Um, we spoke a little uh, while back about, um, I think it was Oleg that mentioned, you know, if we could predict this stuff happening on the force, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, but I, I do believe that the CCRB is your crystal ball of sorts uh, referenced um, you know, by, uh, uh, by a uh, uh, first deputy commissioner in those stats provided on race and gender. So I, I just want to continue to lean on um, the statistics and the work of the CCRB um, to get to that data, um, to identify officers who may be acting out of bigotry and explicit bias. I think that that is a, a, a really good place to start and a good place to uh, really, really um, work through. So I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you. Thank you, chairs. Um, unless you have other follow-up questions, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order that you raised your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant in Arms will set the timer, then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. And again, if you have any written testimony, please submit it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I would now like to welcome Deborah Lolai to testify. After Deborah, I will be calling on Marianne Kaishian and then Jenveen Wong. Deborah, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Time starts now. 
Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Lalloy, and I'm the supervising attorney of the LGBTQ Defense Project at the Bronx Defenders. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I'm here to discuss NYPD misconduct against transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary people. A major part of my work is representing LGBTQ people in criminal cases. Our office has represented thousands of TGNC NB people in criminal cases. With every TGNC NB person who is arrested by the NYPD, there comes a horror story about their arrest and their experience being in NYPD custody. As I'm sure you all know, the NYPD has a record of abusing TGNC NB New Yorkers throughout history. As a result of this pattern of abuse, the NYPD patrol guide was revised in 2012 to include protections for TGNC and B arrestees. In the hundreds of TGNC and B clients I have represented personally in criminal cases, there has never been one client whose arrest and treatment by the involved officers fully complied with the 2012 revisions. Our clients are routinely profiled by the police Throughout the course of their arrest, they are physically assaulted, sexually assaulted, called derogatory names targeting their sexual orientation or gender identity, placed in the wrong holding cells, and misgendered orally and in police paperwork. For example, our client Kimberly begged officers not to be placed in a holding cell with men, and she was only removed after she tried to hang herself. Our other client, Diamond, was so severely injured by officers who were calling her derogatory names targeting her gender identity and sexual orientation while they were assaulting her that she had to be sent to the hospital to get stitches before seeing a judge. Our client, Ms. Dominguez, who recently settled her lawsuit against the NYPD, was arrested and charged with false personation for providing both her previous and current legal names to officers. During the arrest, officers repeatedly mocked her gender. Just this past July, BuzzFeed reported a story of a transgender man, Jamel Young, who was sexually assaulted by officers who grabbed his crotch and chest in order to determine his sex. This is a practice explicitly banned within the NYPD, yet it still happens. It has been demonstrated that unless further action is taken to ensure that transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary people are treated with dignity and respect by the NYPD, the department will continue to perpetuate violence against TGNC and B arrestees. We appreciate the committee's attention to this issue. We ask that police misconduct towards our clients in their custody be investigated and efforts be made to remedy these serious problems. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the members, we'll move on to the next panelists. Are there any questions? Just what, how, many, how many panelists do we have? We have currently uh, four panelists. Four panelists. Um, yeah, I have a question. Are you, you know, the NYPD testified that there's been progress and you're, I'm curious, how long have you been at the Bronx Defenders and have you seen progress in the NYPD's responsiveness or is it business as usual? I have uh, been at the Bronx Defenders doing this work since 2014, um, only two years after the 2012 revisions went into effect. And I, I cannot tell you whether there's been progress at the NYPD. What I can tell you is what I see on the ground and what my clients' experiences are and what they're reporting to me. And there has been no change in what they are reporting to me. They are still reporting to me every single time I see a transgender client at arraignments. They are reporting stories of abuse, harassment, terrible treatment, all targeting their gender identity um, and in complete violation of the patrol guide. In fact, um, you're probably aware of the uh, 2017 report published by the Department of Investigation, which confirms this. Um, and I'll tell you, there has been uh, no change that I have been able to see since 2017. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Deborah. Unless there are any questions from other members, we'll move on to the next panelist who will be 
Marianne Kaishan, followed by Jen Veen Wong, and then Jin Kwok. Marianne, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you. As Senior Policy Counsel at Brooklyn Defender Services, I want to thank the committees for holding this important discussion, as online comments are reflected by real-life harm. While at BDS, I've primarily served young people who are mostly Black and Latinx. Many carry police-related trauma, have experienced overt bias by the police, including the use of racist, homophobic, and gendered slurs, and face biased police practices, such as constant police presence and surveillance, pretextual car stops, and routine stop and frisks. As defenders, we see the direct results of two salient data-backed trends that are consistent with bias and enforcement. Black and brown New Yorkers are disproportionately targeted for stops and arrests on a systemic level, and individuals who engage in displays of bias remain on the NYPD and are promoted. We can't allow the police to frame this discussion as about the perception of bias within the NYPD. Biased policing is a real issue with concrete ramifications for targeted people. This is a policing issue, not a PR issue. We offer a number of recommendations in our written testimony, and I'd also direct the council's attention to the recent report by CCI that was from the perspective of, of young people. But in my limited time, I'd like to emphasize the following. First and foremost, the council must divest from the NYPD and invest in communities. Where a society allocates its budget is a statement of its values. It is time that this city place primary value on the experiences and needs of its community members. This is not a reckless or naive denial of the existence or impact of violence on communities. It's a call for real solutions that do not involve prioritizing the funding of, of oppressive police forces that have repeatedly demonstrated disinterest and even aggressive antipathy towards the well being of those same communities while failing to protect them. To illustrate this point, I often think of the time a young person who had described near daily harassment by police in his majority black housing development, showed me the artwork he made incorporating the names of over a dozen of his friends who had been killed. I asked him if any of their murders had been solved. He told me that only one had because that person had been killed by the police. We must consider the message it sends our young people when we cut summer youth employment programs, but pay officers like Clouseau Coble, or when teachers are shortchanged, while the NYPD again blows past its overtime allowance by $100 million. Some of the so-called solutions of devised policing offered translate to additional funds to the NYPD. We must consider the message we send about the value of human dignity when we defund everything but the police. We must also hold accountable officers who receive complaints of bias. These serious issues persist because of top-down institutional forces and a system of promotions and unaccountability for officers who repeatedly engage in harmful behavior. For all the measures you heard about today, we know that the NYPD has only ever substantiated one case of biased policing, and it was I'm against sorry. a school safety officer. The city council must use its authority to prioritize the safety and needs of New Yorkers over the self-serving preferences of the NYPD, which is currently tasked with and making a mockery of policing itself. I thank you for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from members? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. I will now call upon Jen Veen Wong, followed by Jane Kwok. Jen Veen, you may begin. Thank you. My name is Jen Veen Wong, and I'm a public I'm defender with the Cop Accountability Project at the Legal Aid Society. The Legal Aid Society is the largest public defense organization in the country, and by contract with the city, um, the society serves as the primary defender for low-income people prosecuted in the state court system, the overwhelming majority of whom are Black and Brown. And with the COP Accountability Project, I have been working to improve police accountability and transparency through litigation and advocacy against problematic policing policies. I thank this committee for the opportunity to testify, and I echo the concerns and the testimony of my colleagues at the Bronx Defenders and at BDS. This summer, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, millions of Americans took to the streets to confront white supremacy and police violence, and hundreds and thousands of New Yorkers joined that movement. But New York City Police Department met them with batons, body slams, and chokeholds. And this brutal response came as no surprise. The NYPD has operated within a culture of impunity for decades. And that culture links the actions of this individual officer, Cobell, 
uh, to systemic issues that plague the MIPD and why the city cannot address the former without tackling the latter. And for the city council to take racism, bias and hate speech and policing seriously, it must turn its attention to the mayor and police commissioner's current failure to heed the call for reform issued by this summer's uprising and the state government's response to it. On June 12th, the governor had issued an executive order directing local governments to come together to reinvent a plan for public safety. And the governor specifically directed that stakeholders come from communities with high numbers of police interactions, from nonprofit and faith-based community groups, local DAs, and public defenders and elected officials. But the mayor's committee to lead that effort has not included any DAs or public defenders. And more importantly, it does not include directly impacted people who stand at the front lines of the police reform movement. And instead, he has placed the reins of this project in the hands of the NYPD, an agency that has failed to police themselves. And now we are confronted by yet another flagrant example of racism within NYPD's ranks. This time from um, Inspector Deputy Cobell, who of all positions held Deputy Inspector in charge, in charge of the Equal Opportunity for the Department. And those hateful online messages were words of the bigot, and they should horrify this committee, but it should not be surprising. ProPublica reported in 2015 about a racist blog about um, a racist blog in which posts, posts were posted by uh, current and former New York City officers. And while officers have been disciplined in the past, such discipline only comes after the comments are exposed by external sources, leaving open the question of how many similar incidents go unreported. It would be a failure to simply isolate Cobell as a bad apple without addressing the systemic racism that pervades every aspect of this department. That racism has operated like a cancer for decades, infecting everything from NYPD's policies and enforcement strategies to its commanding officers, union leadership, and its own internal disciplinary process. Nor have reform efforts been adequate. Recent reports on body-worn camera and implicit bias training found no substantive change in decision-making nor behavior. I've submitted written testimony that details the many ways in which this bias has pervaded the department to be considered in conjunction with my testimony today. The city council can do something though. The city council has the power now to demand changes. The city council has the power now to demand changes to the governor's pro to the governor's uh, mandated process and to salvage this opportunity it presents for meaningful change. I'm asking this committee to consider a resolution condemning the mayor's failure to abide by the spirit of the governor's executive order and signal that it will not accept any police reform plan that fails to center the voices of communities most impacted by racism within the NYPD and to address the root causes of inequity, including the NYPD's well-established failure to effectively address misconduct like those attributed to Mr. Cobell. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from members? Thank you for your testimony. So we will move on to our next panelist, who is Jin Kwok. Jin, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you to the committee chairs for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jin Kwok. I'm the community outreach specialist at the New York City Anti-Violence Project, also known as ABP. ABP serves LGBTQ, trans and gender non-conforming and HIV affected communities and offers support to LGBTQ survivors of violence through our 24 seven hotline. We first, we've heard firsthand experiences of racism, bias and harm experienced by our community members at the hands of the NYPD. Since January, we've supported 55 survivors of police violence. Some reported police violence as a primary type of violence. Others experienced police violence in addition to other forms of violence, such as intimate partner violence and hate violence, and were re-victimized by the police when seeking safety. One source of this police violence is that the NYPD's history of targeting trans people of color and IDing them as sex workers using transphobic and homophobic measures. The death of Leilin Polanco at Rikers is a horrific example of such targeting. As reported by ProPublica, the NYPD targets, harasses, and sets up people of color in working class neighborhoods and sting operations directed at those buying or selling sex and uses arrests to fill quotas and stack up overtime pay. As a former sex worker and survivor of violence myself, I will not let my sex working community be seen as overtime meal tickets for cops. It's just not fair and it ain't right. Survival sex work is ultimately a result of a lack of housing, employment, and blatant racism and discrimination of the community we serve. Yet, the city offers us no resources while the police department continues to target, harass, and profile us. The city should defund the NYPD vice department and enforce end enforcement of sex work offenses 
end sting operations and work to fully fund the Sex Worker Resource Center to offer sex workers housing, health services, and financial assistance, which will truly lead to safety and security in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from members? Thank you for your testimony and thank you for telling your own story. Thanks. At this time, if your name has not been called and you still wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. It doesn't look like there's anyone left to testify. Just a reminder to all hearing participants to please submit any written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. I will now turn it back to Chair Torres for closing remarks. Um, I'm just proud of the investigation that we did and I know that my colleagues are gonna continue the groundwork that we've laid. I'm not gonna be here uh, to continue that work, um, but it's been a pleasure to be a colleague of yours, Adrian, to be a colleague of yours, Andy. I know, Andy, you're gonna excel in the judiciary and Adrian, you're gonna be a phenomenal chair of the Public Safety Committee. Um, and uh, I look forward to, to working with you in the next chapter of my life. Uh, with that said, I don't know if you have any words, but I, I'll leave it to you to adjourn the meeting. Richie, I, I'm speechless, you know, whenever, uh, you know, we've had uh, hearings, this is actually our first joint hearing together in our last Unfortunately, uh, you are my seatmate in the chambers and um, I will miss you dearly. Um, I, I just wanna share publicly the first time that I met you, I knew that I was interacting with brilliance and you have not failed um, that moniker for me, not one day of us knowing each other. I wish you well. I know that you are going to blow the doors off of Congress. I thank everybody for participating in this hearing today. Thank you for all of the staff. Thank you for all of the legal counsel. Thank you especially to my phenomenal, phenomenal co-chair, uh, Congressman-elect Richie Torres, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to all of our public that came to testify today, our colleagues that are here. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>